my God. I'm back. I'm home. All the time. We finally really did it. You maniac! You blew it up! Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. It's really good to have all of you here today. Thank you for joining me. Let me turn this light down a little bit. It's too bright. That seems a lot better. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Uh, we're going to have a fun, kind of chill stream today. It's too dim. Maybe one more up. There we go. Glad you could make it. If anybody's here for the very first time, whether you're watching live, hello chat, or whether you're watching in the future, in the VOD, or, uh, or on YouTube, welcome to Paleontologizing. My name is Danny Anduzo. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch, uh, trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach, you know? One vast supercontinent. And... Soon occupied every corner of that world. Thank you, Megatronus95, for the uh, four months of support there. Really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Yes, as a dinosaur paleontologist, I dig up dinosaurs with various museums uh, across the American West. I study dinosaurs, I publish on them in the scientific literature, and uh, yeah, I talk about dinosaurs here on Twitch five days a week, every weekday. And I am incredibly lucky to be able to make my living this way. Thank you for all of the support that allows me to do this. It's uh, pretty special. And I am deeply grateful for uh, for everybody who's made this a reality through uh, their generous support. Thank you, thank you. This is my means of doing science outreach. I believe that our world would be a better place if more scientists were able to reach out to the public and talk to folks about, about science and... Yeah, try and demystify different fields of science. So that's what I'm trying to do here with paleontology. I'm trying to give you an inside peek into how fossil science works. And uh, any questions that you have are fair game. So do not be shy, whether you're curious about... If you've got specific questions about a particular dinosaur. Questions about how we dig up and study dinosaurs. If you've got questions about the fossil record in general, the history of life on Earth how science works in general? Don't be shy with those questions. You ask them. On today's broadcast, it's going to be kind of a lazy stream today, so I uh, hope you're cool with that. We're going to be watching an old 1982 show called Dinosaurs, Fun, Fact, and Fantasy. It is from the UK. It is goofy and fun and corny and... Very outdated, and it's going to be wonderful fodder for discussion today. Dinosaur science has changed a tremendous amount in the past 40 years. So yeah, we're going to be talking all about it. Should be a lot of fun. And uh, we'll also be having some dinosaur deep dives, I bet. Uh, and we can do those on the spot now. So, uh, take note. Origin TT, thank you very much for your raid earlier. I really appreciate that. How was your stream, Origin? I hope it was wonderful. It's great to see you. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. Yeah. And Proud Slime Dad. I don't think I've seen you here before. Or maybe it's Proud's Lime Dad. Is it slime or lime? You let me know, Dad. It's good to have you here. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Um, the stream is very good. Glad to hear it, Origin TT. Excellent. Here, let me uh, scroll up to the top of chat right now. We'll see who's here. We'll do some greetings. All that good stuff. I know I'm starting early today. I often start early on Wednesdays. I should have put that on the calendar if I didn't yet. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a fun stream. 
Kodali2010 was first today. How you doing, Kodali? Welcome, welcome. Great to see you. Hope all is well. Fall Machine, what's shaking? I hope you're doing well, too. It's good to see you. Layer T, howdy, howdy. By the way, if we do have any sound issues throughout this stream, let me know. Because I had to redo some of the audio here in OBS um, after a major snafu from yesterday. So, yeah. Um, but the good thing is this, if everything works according to plan, which so far mostly is, it'll be easier to upload videos to YouTube without having to worry about uh, getting flagged for copyright. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pimpcat, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Uh, Dr. Javasaurus, howdy, howdy. Hope you're doing well. Uh, Swoo-boo, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Newton Tango, what's shaking? Glad you're here. Uh, Metal Meows, did I say hello to you yet? Welcome, welcome, Metal Meows. Hello, hello. And, uh, yeah, San Diego Zoo is here, too. How are you doing, San Diego Zoo? Do you think dinosaurs are put together correctly? The bones. <laughs> you're smart. What Very do you question. think? Do a research I'm, on that, I, Oliver. I, I never. <laughs> Poor John Oliver. Luna, Luna Sundi Ego. Thank you, Luna Sundi Ego, for that follow and welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Trappy Jenkins is here too. How are you doing, Trappy? Welcome, welcome. It's great to see you. Trappy, we did your dinosaur deep dive yesterday. Um, so check out the VOD for that. Yeah. Tactile 3D picture. Uh. I've not checked that out yet. No, sorry. I've been pretty busy tactile, but thank you for posting it. Hopefully I'll get a chance to do that soon. Uh, Panther Pyre, how are you doing? It's good to see you. Welcome, welcome. Uh, and Ali J is half awake right now. It's early where you are, isn't it, Ali J? I hope your morning's off to a good start, though. It's good to see you. Uh, uh, Portugask, howdy, howdy. Hope all is well, Portugask. Uh, and Big Ball of Yarn. How are you doing? Welcome back to Paleontologizer. Yeah. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed that cold open video there. I've not played that one in a long time. It, it could use some work, honestly. <laughs> but yeah. Um, Original Old Dog. What's shaking with you? Good to see ya. Sergeant Raccoon. Hello, hello. Hope things are good. And, uh, all right. Uh, Timber's here, too. How are you doing, Timber86SS? What's shaking, Timber? Good to have you here. Yeah. Uh, Tactile says, Some people claim that you make all this up. The dinosaur never existed. Which one? Personally, I don't think those people are right in the head. What are your thoughts on that? I don't think those people exist, Tactile. I have never seen any convincing evidence that dinosaur deniers are actually real and earnest. I am not convinced that anybody actually believes that. I think they're just making it up, you know? Nobody is that stupid. Seriously. It just doesn't make any sense. So yeah, anyway, sorry to... I don't mean to be unkind about it. But no, that really is the kindest take of all, isn't it? Nobody's, nobody's that dense, you know? Yeah. Um, they, a lot of people just want attention, you know? Yeah, my thoughts exactly. There you go. Yeah. Reno, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Great to see you, Reno. I hope you're having a good day so far. Uh, and uh, Dither00, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. And uh, let's see... Pimp cat, the mummified crocodiles? Yeah, that was a few months ago. I did hear about that pimp cat. That's very cool stuff. Yeah. Really neat. Like, flat earth people, they're not right in the... I mean, tactile, it's... I don't know. I do think there are a lot of people where they... I don't know. To be charitable, I think they don't really care about what's true or what's false. Like, those... The idea of true or false doesn't really, like, come into their worldview. And so they'll just say crazy stuff for attention. And, yeah, I don't know. It's, like, it's difficult for me to fathom. It runs completely counter to the entire point of science. But some people are just like that. Especially in the age of the internet, you know? 
anybody can say whatever they want and they can gain an audience for it and it's it's pretty nuts so yeah yeah you'd be surprised who and what lurks online i know right big ball of yarn yeah uh and how are you doing timber welcome welcome yeah uh and who that got yeah well to be fair that I also think he is pulling our leg. That was, um, what was it? William Hayes, I think was his name. Who was, uh, it's on the football team in LA, the Anaheim Angels or whatever. Um, whatever the football team is in LA. I think it's the Angels. Could be wrong. Los Angeles, Los Angeles Angels. I think it's the Angels. Anyway, um, yeah, that's actually something I've never heard that conspiracy theory before, but that could be pretty amusing. The idea that professional sports are all fake. Yeah, it's all staged. Or like you start off with professional wrestling and you go, well, shoot, if they're lying to us about that, then uh, what else are they lying to us about? If professional wrestling is all fake, then what about Professional baseball, professional basketball, um, horse racing, horseshoes, horse fighting. Are horses even real, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. And uh, a sports ball player. Yeah, Layer T, broadly speaking. Australia truthers are my favorite. Are those people who deny the existence of Australia? Oh, boy. Yeah. Um, in Timber, Trasic Stem Sicilian supports uh, dyserophoid origin of living amphibian. Oh, interesting, Timber. Very cool. Yeah. You remember Roller Derby. Yeah, I was friends with some roller derby people back in, uh, some roller derby gals back in Montana. Uh, yeah, Pimpcat says, nice lava lamp. Thank you, Pimpcat. It, see, I'm wearing a different color shirt today, and that means that you can see the lava lamp. That's how this camera sensor works, is that if the shirt is, the, the color is too light, it overwhelms the sensor, and then, uh, yeah. Anyway, you can actually see the lava lamp today. Um, but yeah, dinosaur deniers live on the flat earth. I mean, sure, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I believe your bushy beard is not real. Looks glued in, tactile. Well, I mean, shoot. Must be some pretty strong glue, you know? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, and uh, Proud Slime Dad says it's truly remarkable how large an impact only a handful of people can have on public opinion slash consciousness. Well, yeah, I think you know I was just thinking about this today, and part of me wanted to do a a stream about about like you know anti science and stuff like that. Little Uzi Nate. Thank you for the 20 months of support. Hey Danny, sad I missed the DDDs. No worries. Yeah. Dino news in the last month. Oh shoot, in the last month. You know, dinosaur news has been a little bit uh It's been a little bit paltry for the past 3 weeks to be honest. I'd say the coolest piece of news that I can share with you right now. Uh the coolest piece of dinosaur news from 2023 in my opinion. Um, is here. There we go. Uh, there's a really cool paper that came out looking at Sariyamas, these very cool living birds that actually use their feet to dispatch their prey. And it used them as kind of a, an analogy looking at dromaeosaurids, raptor dinosaurs, like the raptors from Jurassic Park. Um, my old crew chief, Denver Fowler, published a paper saying that dromaeosaurs probably used their claws not for slashing, 
not slashing with those toe claws, but using them to pin down their prey while they kind of eat it alive. That's what Sariamas do today. And so this paper was talking about that, and it's, uh, yeah, pretty cool stuff. Um, really neat. Um... Trying to find you that. Um, there we go. Yeah, here's the paper. Um, but this sort of thing is right up my alley. Very, very cool. Uh, we conclude the killing claw is for pinning prey, not for slashing. New videos and pics of the project right here. This is on the Fossil Crates website. We just watched a video from Fossil Crates yesterday. But here is a Sariema. Uh, going after somebody's car keys, it looks like. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah, those claws used for pinning rather than for slashing. And it's the same deal when they're... Uh... Yeah, it is the same deal when they're... Say, going after their prey. Like this plastic snake, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Very nice. So, yeah, really, really cool paper. And the link to the paper is right... Where? That's... Oh, it is here. There we go. Observation of claw use and feeding behavior of the red-legged Sariema and its implication for claw use in Deinonychosaurs. I think this kind of research is really, really cool. And uh, we talked about that live on stream. I actually emailed the authors and got a copy of that paper. It's pretty great. So, yeah. Uh, but anyway. Let's see. Blinkster says, I found out today that a dinosaur with an extensive vocabulary is called a thesaurus. Very funny, Blinkster. Uh, I believe that's an old uh, Bizarro cartoon, isn't it? Yeah. Or was it Bizarro or was it something else? Hmm. Trying to find that. I don't know if it's going to pop up. Yeah. Ah, that's okay. Um. Anywho, yeah. And uh, thank you, thank you, Oscar Juniors, for uh, suggesting a dinosaur deep dive there. Let's do that right now, actually, Oscar Juniors. Let's do some Diplodocus. Yeah. Uh, what is the cooldown on deep dives? 60 minutes now, Claire Burr. It is decreased as of last night. It's gone from one dinosaur deep dive per stream to now one per hour. So yeah. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Diplodocus, shall we? And this is actually a lovely opportunity for me to try out our new audio thing. Um, here we go. Mm -hmm. There we go. Take a look at this. This dinosaur, Diplodocus. Uh, iconic American dinosaur. It is... Shoot. It helped to shape people's perceptions of dinosaurs way back around the turn of the century. This, in many cases, was the very first dinosaur that many people ever saw. So it is a dinosaur that is intimately tied in with people's perceptions of dinosaurs around the planet. Uh, here's a depiction of it from 1999's uh, Walking with Dinosaurs. Take a look. Forest. There are vast open fern prairies. There we go. Uh. Ooh. 
Hang on. Bliss9 says no audio? Are you not hearing any audio right here? Hmm. Shoot, this is exactly what I was trying to fix. Hang on. Give me a second here. Can you hear any audio now? Is there any, uh, is there any music going right now? Can you hear any music? No. Okay, give me a second here. This is what I was messing around with earlier. Hopefully I can do this live. If not, this is going to be irritating. Um... Let's see, Twitch VOD track 2. It's not letting me change those right now. Oh boy. Um, advanced audio properties. That is really irritating. Give me a second here. Okay, let's try this. Uh, let me know if it's working now. Hmm. All right, great. Volume's a bit low, I can turn it up. Yeah, like Diplodocus. There we go. <laughs> Truly iconic sauropod dinosaurs. I can turn the volume up higher, yeah. How's that? Those are damselflies. Yeah. Not dragonflies, but damselflies. Who can tell me how to tell the difference between a dragonfly and a damselfly? Hmm. How does one tell the difference? Damselflies are cool, Reno. This is true. From the spelling, says Bliss9. If you were to see one in the wild, though... Pimpcat says wings. What about the wings? Ooh. Dem's supplies are probably huge. Uh, it's not that they only have two wings, I don't think. You're right, Layer T. It's how the wings sit. Absolutely. Let me show you real quick. Um, dragonfly versus damselfly. So dragonflies hold their wings out to the sides, like that. Damselflies fold their wings up against their abdomen, like that. So damselflies are kind of long, and dragonflies are wide, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? I hope it does. These are both very early diverging insects, so these guys branched off a long, long time ago, and they're among the first insects to develop flight, which is pretty neat. So, uh, side wings versus up. There you go, Ali J. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Astonishing. Simply astonishing. One of the most singular specimens I've encountered in all my distinguished career. <laughs> but enough about my work. 
What did you want to show me, Lisa? X Bonezo, how are you doing? Bones, welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. I have many bones here in my office, not just in my body. Because I have my very own internal skeleton, like I assume most of you watching right now do. But lots of bones right here, including some on the 3D printer right now. I haven't even looked at the 3D printer yet. And we're doing pretty well there. I'm printing an iguanodon hand. So here are two of the fingers that should be kind of slowly rising up throughout the rest of this stream. More of our iguanodon fingers. And uh, feeling very welcome? You are very welcome here, Bones. Great to have you. Can I ask uh, how you found the channel? I'd, I'd love to know. Be useful information. Danny has a funny bone? Just one, Ali J? But yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and Pimpcat says, is Diplodocus closely related to Brontosaurus, Apatosaurus? Yes, Pimpcat, we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's get back to our, uh, our video here. <laughs> we don't know if they really did that. It would make sense. This is kind of a neat idea. <laughs> you can imagine these enormous, enormous dinosaurs. <laughs> These dinosaurs are, they're like walking ecosystems. Such cool critters. Yeah. And they're also, they they do a lot of pooping too. I won't subject you to that. But, uh, yeah. Diplodocus. There you go. As I was saying, Diplodocus is one of the most iconic dinosaurs. <sighs> It is, like, just outside of the, the like, big five or big six dinosaurs that most people know about. I mean, what would those be? You know, Tyrannosaurus, Velociraptor, Stegosaurus, Triceratops, and Brontosaurus, I guess, would be uh, number five. Uh, Diplodocus might be number six, if there is a number six, you know? Really spectacular. Spared no expense. And thank you, Ali J, for gifting Bones there. Appreciate that, Ali J. Thank you, thank you, Ali. Excellent. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, and you're just scrolling for science. Oh, very cool. Uh, heard of the Carboniferous period the other day. Very cool, Bones. Well... That's awesome. We actually have a command about that. Type in, somebody type in exclamation mark oxygen. And most folks know Ankylosaurus. I guess this is also true, Lenina. Yeah. Uh, a lot of folks know Pachycephalosaurus, too. Those would be, like, one tier down from the those big five. You know? I'd say about the same number of people probably know Ankylosaurus as know Diplodocus. Roughly speaking, I don't know. It'd be nice to actually get real data on this someday. But yeah, yeah. Parasaurolophus would be another one, Dr. Javasaurus, yeah. Yeah. Jurassic Park dinosaurs, sure. Dr. Javasaurus, yeah. Yeah. Um. Anyway, yeah. The reason I asked for that Carboniferous, or the, the oxygen command, by the way, is that yes, during the Carboniferous period, oxygen levels were really high, and a lot of folks tend to get that mixed up with the Age of Dinosaurs. Carboniferous was long before the Age of Dinosaurs. So dinosaurs didn't get big because of increased oxygen levels, but lots of big invertebrates did during the Carboniferous. You had millipedes the size of a car and stuff like that. Anyway, Diplodocus. Let me find you a decent Diplodocus image here. There we go. Yeah. Uh, today, this is a dinosaur that is really, really well known. Um, not just in popular culture, but also in the fossil record. It's like the second most common sauropod in the Morrison Formation, the late Jurassic of North America. So this is a dinosaur that lived in places like Utah, Wyoming, Montana, 
North and South Dakota. Uh, probably up into Canada, too. And probably down south into New Mexico and maybe Mexico as well. Um, Diplodocus gave its name to a whole group called the Diplodocids. Tessifer, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. So there's a whole group of dinosaurs that bear this name. Diplodocus is the one that they're all named after. Um, Diplodocids are Diplodocus, uh, Apatosaurus. Uh, here's Apatosaurus here. Apatosaurus is like a super chonky Diplodocus. Everything about them is chonkier, except for maybe the end of the tail. So while Diplodocus is very kind of lithe and skinny and graceful, Apatosaurus is a chonker. You know. Uh, she's a thick girl. Apatosaurus. Uh, so, yeah, and both these dinosaurs lived in the same time in the same place. There's Apatosaurus right there. Um, a lot chonkier than Diplodocus. But, uh, let's see if I can find you a video on Dippy the Diplodocus, maybe. Um, because Dippy... It's a, there's a really, really interesting story here. Here, let's take a look at... This. This might do it. There we go. There she is. Perhaps the most iconic dinosaur skeleton in the UK is on tour. Hmm. Being one of the largest creatures to ever walk the Earth, hundreds of thousands of people have seen this Diplodocus skeleton on its tour so far. <laughs> this is Dippy the Diplodocus. Yeah. <laughs> How many of you in chat have actually seen Dippy in person? Either this particular skeletal cast at the Natural History Museum in London, or when it went on tour, or if you've seen it at another museum. Maybe the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, or the... Shoot, the one that I did some live streams from. Uh, the uh, Utah Fieldhouse Museum in Vernal, Utah. There's a number of other, like, what is it? Mexico City, Buenos Aires... Uh, I think Beijing, um, Brussels, I think, has one. Uh, I want to say Madrid has a, a copy of Dippy as well. Uh, if you've ever seen Dippy in person, let me know. The Diplodocus. Yeah. The Diplodocus was a large plant-eating dinosaur that lived during the Jurassic period. The cast became famous as it was displayed in the Natural History Museum for many years. Yep. Being a first impression for many visitors, it became a museum icon. Hmm. However, after more than 110 years on display in the Natural History Museum, it was eventually replaced by a real skeleton of a blue whale. Hmm. Despite That's the enormous size of the Diplodocus, Tippy isn't quite as big as the 25.2 meter long blue whale skeleton named Hope. The blue well, whale is the yeah. largest animal to ever live, and the skeleton has been described Maybe. as a symbol of humanity's power to shape a sustainable future. Tippy left the Natural History Museum on a natural history adventure, touring hmm. across the country. The skeleton cast made a visit to the Dorset County Museum, Birmingham. Cool, Ironheart, Park Brick Gallery. Girl, yeah. On January the twenty-second, two thousand and nineteen, Dippy was installed in the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery in Glasgow. Smith and the really created a big response to our visit. I was hoping there'd be more about the history of. Yeah, because it's a really, really interesting story how Dippy came to be such an icon. And I'm, uh... Hmm. It deals with the robber baron, uh, Andrew Carnegie. This was his dinosaur in Diplodocus. Diplodocus Carnegie is actually named after him. Here, I betcha this video from the Carnegie Museum might do it justice here. Let's take a look. You may already be familiar with Diplodocus carnegii, the dinosaurs yeah. affectionately referred to as Dippy, our beloved mascot. <laughs> but do you know this fossil's origin story? Ah, this is what we wanted. The museum begins with a newspaper article in late 1898 that claims yeah. the most colossal animal ever on Earth just found out west. This news quickly <laughs> caught the attention of museum founder Andrew Carnegie. And by the way, that was a really iconic newspaper headline, too. Let's see if I can find you a high-res version of that. Uh, there we go. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh. It'd be really awesome to have like an original copy of this, or even just a really nice print up on the wall. Yeah. Most colossal animal ever found on Earth. No, most colossal animal ever on Earth just found out west. When it walked the Earth, trembled under its weight of 120,000 pounds. When it ate, it filled a stomach large enough to hold three elephants. When it was angry, its terrible roar could be heard ten miles. When it stood up, its height was equal to 11 stories of a skyscraper. None of those are true. This is kind of, you know, yellow journalism of the time. That's a Ceratosaurus skull right there. This is not the skull of a sauropod at all. We actually have a Ceratosaurus right up here. Uh, on camera, there we go. Right here is my 3D printed Ceratosaurus skull. Anyway, yeah. But they are calling this Brontosaurus at the time. Anyway, Andrew Carnegie got wind of this. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Just found out west. This news quickly caught the attention of museum founder Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie asked the museum's director, Dr. William Holland, to get a dinosaur for Pittsburgh. And so a team of paleontologists traveled to Wyoming. In early July 1899, after a few hmm. months of searching... And the guy from Carnegie Hall... I mean, Carnegie Hall is named after Andrew Carnegie, yes. For fossils in several hey, thieves, how you doing? Welcome, welcome. Totally welcome. uncovered some yeah. very impressive bones at Sheep Creek, Wyoming. Yeah. These were so big and so many that they filled 130 crates, an entire boxcar, when they were sent back to Pittsburgh. Carnegie mm -hmm. Museum paleontologists freed these fascinating fossils from the surrounding rock and discovered a new species of dinosaur, naming it Diplodocus carnegii. Yeah. The new wing of the museum was built to display this 85-foot-long specimen. So hmm. excited was the world about this fossil that King Edward VII asked Andrew Carnegie for a dinosaur for England. <laughs> a cast or replica of Dippy was made under Carnegie Museum scientist supervision, shipped to England and put on display in yep. London's British Museum of Natural History. And it wasn't the only one. Eventually, nine more replicas of Dippy were made and sent to places all over the world, including... I think there's actually more. Madrid, Paris in Mexico City. It's yep. so exciting that Dippy can be seen all over the world, but only here in Dinosaurs in Their Time in Carnegie Museum of Natural History can anyone see the real thing. Yep. So somebody was asking in chat earlier, like, oh, you never actually show real dinosaurs on display, right? Like, you wouldn't put the actual fossils up on display. No, this is the original Diplodocus skeleton there at the Carnegie Museum. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Synthberry is asking this. So the other ones are cast, but these are the original fossils. It's a lot more difficult. It's a lot trickier to put the actual fossils up on display because they tend to be a lot heavier, more delicate. You can't just jam support rods straight through them. You've got to build like a complex armature, kind of gently cradle all of the bones in place. It's just a much more... It's a lot more hassle to mount an actual skeleton like that. Then you got to make sure that people aren't you know, aren't messing with it too. Visitors can get crazy sometimes. So it's just a much more, it's a lot more complicated to mount an actual dinosaur skeleton, but it does happen. There's the original Diplodocus Carnegie eye. Uh, it's actually a composite. There's a, there's a number of different dinosaur individuals that went into creating this. I think the hind legs are from a slightly different, uh, from a different sauropod specimen. And there's a few bones that have been filled in as well, but it's relatively complete. Um, but yeah, yeah. If you'd like to learn more about this, then I'd recommend the Wikipedia article for one. But there's also a great book. There's that Wikipedia article. Yep, she's a composite Diplodocus skeleton, like I was telling you. There's, uh, a few different individuals that contributed bones. Yep, and there's the photo from the same angle, shoot at the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Discovery. There's the London cast right there who is super famous in her own right. And then we've also got one in London, in Berlin, in Paris, in Vienna, in Bologna, in St. Petersburg, Buenos Aires, Madrid, Mexico City, Munich. Uh, there's a replica or a steel I don't know, metal sculpture outside uh, in Pittsburgh. And then, of course, the one that I have actually done a live stream from underneath. 
Utah Fieldhouse Museum in Little Vernal, Utah. All these other, like, world capitals, these big, grandiose cities, and then Vernal, Utah. <laughs> uh, gateway to Utah's dinosaur land. Vernal, Utah also has their very own fiberglass and polyester cast of Dippy. So yeah, anyway, here is that article. And then let me show you, there's an excellent book uh, about this as well. I would highly recommend it. I just read it, reread it this summer, this past uh, July. Um, where did that go? It is called Bone Wars by Tom Rea. And... There we are. Bone Wars by Tom Rea. This is the, the new 20th anniversary edition, which just came out a year or two ago. Um, I first read this book when I was in middle school, I think. Um, back, you know, a long time ago. Uh, but yeah. The Excavation and Celebrity of Andrew Carnegie's Dinosaur. Uh, would highly recommend this book. Good stuff. Um... I'll see if I can find it for you on Thrift Books, maybe. The new edition, it does have, like, a new afterword, I think. Um, with, I think, Matt Lamana? Matt Lamana? Sauropod paleontologist? But, uh... Yeah, Bone... Bone Wars. Rhea. There we go, shoot. You can get... Uh, let's see. Very good hardcover edition for less than $11 from Thrift Books. Or get it, you know, actually you should call up your local independent bookseller. See if you can uh, get a copy from them. Anyway, Diplodocus. I could talk about this dinosaur for a long time. But, uh, thank you Oscar Juniors for suggesting it. I appreciate it. This is a dinosaur that we'll actually see popping up in our, uh, in our show that we watched today. In more than a few places, you'll see it. So, uh... Yeah, make some noise if you, uh... If you see it in chat. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, Oscar Juniors. Uh... Thousands of books at a single shelf will not hold Sparhawk. I used to have more books than I have today, but I had to leave almost all of them in Montana when I moved away. But I've got... Got a fair number of books here. At least a couple hundred. Yeah. Um, yeah, shelf here, shelf there, shelf there, more books over there and over there. I got a lot of books. I love books. Yeah, how long was the Diplodocus' tail? Like 30 feet long, something like that, Pimp Cat? Approaching 10 meters? Yeah, Diplodocus had a long tail. I mean, a significant portion of this animal's length, overall length, is tail. Um... Yeah, I mean, look at that. Yeah, pretty impressive. And the tail may have been used as a, as a weapon. Um, it is very whip-like. Like, the tail at the very end is... It really is. It's like a whip. Um, in fact... We were looking at this yesterday. Let me try it again. But with... Here we go. So this is, uh... This is Apatosaurus here. Anyway. Yeah. Um... <laughs> uh... Yeah. Anyway, Diplodocids. Like Diplodocus and Apatosaurus. Really cool animals. And, uh... I actually dug up an element from probably one of these animals. Try blaming the dinosaurs. Thank you, Nader Fiend. All distinct lineages of birds are closest to the dinosaurs. I'm guessing Paleognathae. They're all equally closely related, Nader Fiend, because they're all they are all literally dinosaurs, Nader Fiend. Yeah. They've all been evolving for the same length of time from dinosaurs, so they're all they're all equally closely related. Yeah. Um Anyway, yeah. This is me back in October. Working with uh, L.J. Krumenacker out in the field, 
And these are some elements. It doesn't look like much here. Honestly, it, yeah. It's kind of difficult to, like, photograph that and make it look more impressive. But, uh... Yeah, so there's probably a scapula there and part of, like, a sternal or a coracoid. So these are, like, bones from the chest and the shoulder of a big sauropod dinosaur. This is probably... I don't know if it would be from a full-grown adult. But, uh, yeah. Odds are it's either Camarasaurus, Diplodocus, or Apatosaurus. With a slimmer chance of it being Barosaurus. But, yeah. Yeah. We were just out there for a few days this past summer. And, uh... Or this past fall. This past October, October of 2022. Um, but it was pretty great. Yeah, it was nice to be able to take a quick little jaunt out there into Utah and uh, do a little bit of digging. Show some students around and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, green iguanas also whip their tails. They absolutely do, Ravelin, yeah. And that can hurt. That can break the skin. Um, iguanas whipping their tails. Oh, man. Yeah, here, iguana versus cat. So that iguana is not happy. Watch out, cat. Watch out, cat. Oh, boy. Let's see that again. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, uh, Cerebra Fart says maybe you should try drone photography in the field? I mean, I could, but I that's pricey, and I've never used a drone. I don't know if I could afford a drone. I wish somebody else would bring a drone who knows how to use it and take some photographs. That would be pretty cool, because I agree with you. That's a cool idea. Yeah, but drones aren't cheap. Yeah. Uh... But yeah, yeah... And Golganex says, Qu weird question, but in composites, how difficult is it to be certain that the component individuals are at the same stage of onto, I mean, ontogenetic development, Golganek? Yeah. Um, Golganek, back in the day, there were bits and pieces of dinosaurs assembled that, like, they weren't even from the same family of dinosaurs. Like the Triceratops at the Smithsonian. Um, uh, 1920, let's say. Uh, is it here? I think it might be this one here. That looks like the Smithsonian Triceratops. Hatcher is the nickname. Uh, no, this is... Uh, this part's are right. But, um, this may have been after it was corrected, but for a while, I seem to recall that it was actually the the hind limbs of a duck-billed dinosaur that they kind of slapped onto there. Because they're like, well, shoot, we don't have the hind limbs for this Triceratops. What have we got? <laughs> so they just slapped some hadrosaur hind limbs on. It might be the femurs, actually. Because that looks kind of like a hadrosaur femur. Um... So anyway, yeah. With, you know, the longer that we've been doing this whole paleontology thing, the more precise we've gotten with all this, you know? It used to be pretty slapdash in a lot of ways. Not anymore, you know? Yeah. Uh, they will never know. There you go, Pipcat. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Some guy was whittling and lost a thumb. Oof, Trek nerd. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you, thank you to uh, to Oscar Juniors for that dinosaur deep dive there. I appreciate it. And uh, what do you say we get into our main topic for this afternoon? This old show called Dinosaurs, colon... Fun, fact, and fantasy. Believe it or not, I had a VH tape, VHS tape of this when I was a small child. My grandmother, my nana got it for me. And um, 
honestly, it was out of date even at that point. This was produced in 1982. Um, it's a lot of fun. You might even recognize some alerts we took from this. It's been a long time since we've watched it, though, and I thought it would be a fun kind of low-hanging fruit to pick for today. So, uh, yeah, you think you remember this cannabis magic? Well, let's see. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> That's supposed to be Diplodocus there, by the way. Dinosaurs. Fun, fact, and fantasy. Hmm. All of these... Lots of stuff from the British Museum here. Oh, hang on a minute. Okay. Made some weird noises, but it's still doing okay. Anyway, this is, uh... This is a terminally British production here, as you shall see. But, uh, it's good stuff. It's a lot of fun. Hmm. <laughs> Lots of stop motion animation here. Uh, Bones says, I've heard it's hard to get approval for digs in America. Uh, is that true? It depends on where. So, like, here in the United States, it's much easier than it is in most sensible countries. It's altogether way too easy, I think, for people to go out and dig things up and ruin them. Um, yeah. In other countries, you know, important fossils belong to everybody. They belong to the people. They belong to... They're like part of the collective scientific and natural heritage of the people of that country. Here in the U.S., if something is on private land, then it goes to the highest bidder or to the landowner. You know, it's like... It's considered private property regardless of how scientifically important it might be. Um, so yeah, I don't know. You gotta get permits and everything to dig on public land here in the US. Federal land or state land or tribal lands. Um, yeah, there's like a procedures that you have to go through and those kind of ensure that those fossils end up being protected and cared for and available for scientific study. You know, not ending up on, you know, some wealthy person's mantelpiece or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, so I, I don't know. I only ever really work on public land because I work with museums. As a paleontologist, I'm not out there to collect fossils for, for profit or, you know, as a collector's items or anything like that. But they're collecting for science, you know? And so, yeah, as a scientist, it's not difficult to get permits or anything. I'm always working with crews that, uh, you know, got all the proper paperwork in order and all that good stuff. Because we can prove that, hey, we're here to collect fossils, you know, for scientific good. Not for personal gain. Um, but yeah, yeah. So anyway, yeah. Um... And Lilith Hobo, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Appreciate you, Lilith. Thank you, thank you for the raid. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. And Pimpcat says, how do they know when they find the bones that they're all from the same species and not mixed in with one another? Well, hopefully you're finding the bones in some degree of articulation. So... If you're finding a lot of bones together, then hopefully they're still some of them in life position, still stuck together as they would be in life. There are going to be a few parts that are disarticulated, and that has led to some mistakes before. If you find just a jumbled mass of bones, you've got to be much more careful that all of those things actually come from the same critter. But luckily, different kinds of dinosaurs have bones that look very different from one another. Show you an example. Hang on a sec. So 
So this is a baby Triceratops that I'm working on assembling right here. And every single one of these bones from a baby Triceratops is going to look different from bones of, say, a baby Tyrannosaurus right here. They're, uh... If you know your anatomy really well, and if you've studied these dinosaurs in depth, those differences just jump right out to you. So you should be able to tell who's who, even just from, you know, a handful of bones. Take the arm, for instance. There's the arm of a baby Triceratops. Very, very, very different from the arm of, say, a baby T-Rex. Lord Priv, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. So yeah, does that make sense? I hope it does. And, uh... Eschaton, I've been going since May 8th, 2020. I've been full-time for a year and a half now. Yeah. Welcome, Eschaton. Are you interested in science? Natural history? Fossils? If so, you're in the right place. Welcome. Yeah. Anywho, yeah. Uh, let's see. But yeah, yeah. And you're welcome, Bones. You're welcome. Yeah. And Golganix is even in non chimeras, and especially for less well known species. Thank you, Bliss9, for that gift to Eschaton. Look, we're at 2 out of 40 for our, our sub goal today. Thank you, Bliss9. Appreciate that. Thank you, Ali J, for that other gift sub. 2 out of 40. 120th, 5% of the way there. Um, Bogdanik says, especially for less well-known species, I'd be curious to know how many younger, older specimens of the same species got slapped together. The, it's... That has happened before, but usually the size differences are enough that... Yeah, that it's not going to cause that much confusion. If that makes sense, Golganek. I can't think of any examples off the top of my head where um, a young and an old individual of the same species were mixed up and that caused confusion. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, there's been a dirge in my life since the brain scoop stopped. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're here, Eschaton. And gratitude. Thank you very much for the 100 bits. Thank you, Mikey Likes, for those 100 bits. Very much appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, very nice. Oh, and cool tactical, tactile. Very nice. I appreciate that tactile. I'll see if I can check that out in a bit. Here, we gotta, we gotta continue with this. We're less than a minute into this video. Let's, uh... Let's continue. You've seen them on TV. Yeah. And in comic books. But what were they really like? What were they really Where like? Did they live? Hmm. Everywhere on land. All seven continents. <laughs> oh boy. I love the bright red on this theropod here. Very bold. This is going to capture the imagination of any kid watching back in the 80s or 90s. I know it did for me. Yeah. Watch out, little mammals. <laughs> Who is this supposed to be? Megalosaurus, maybe? Polycanthus there? Who did not live at the same time. Megalosaurus is Jurassic. Polycanthus is Cretaceous. And what an old looking Polycanthus. Holy cow. Dragging its tail on the ground. <laughs> roar, roar, roar. And there's some Iguanodon. 
Those look very much like the Invicta Iguanodon. To find out everything you ever wanted to know, we have to go right back in time. Back over 150 million years. Hmm. Ooh. This terrible fight first took place. As you can see, it's not a very pleasant time to be around. And this swamp land... <laughs> one of them was a pushover. Oh, man. That's because the age of the dinosaurs happened a very long time ago. And although this scene actually took place here in England, it was a very different... Not that one precisely, because if that is supposed to be Megalosaurus, Megalosaurus and Iguanodon did not live at the same time. They lived tens of millions of years apart. But, uh, anyway, and that was like Clifford the Big Red Dino, huh, Darian Beagle. Yeah. Uh, welcome back. It's good to see you. actually took place here in England, uh, very different England to the one we know today. Yes, very different. There were no towns and villages, and none of the fields and woodlands that we see today. Hmm. It was a time long before the first men and women were on the earth. Before the time of lorries and the tube, and, uh... And wheelie bins and everything else. World was a very different place to the world we know. <laughs> oh, Ali J, you're right. Kinds of extraordinary plants, and even more extraordinary animals. Ah, uh, not if you're a botanist, around, but sure. The map of the world would have looked like this. The countries. It's very square. <laughs> but yeah, this is what we call Pangaea, and this must have been like cutting edge graphics back in the 1980s. Man, this must have looked super modern. But, uh, and chip butties. There you go, Ali J, yes. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Paper cuts, uh, what do you mean? Uh, that's cryptic. I don't know what you mean, paper cuts. What? Um, yeah. Volume is low. Really? I have it turned all the way up on there. That doesn't make any sense, but anyway, um, yeah, here, let's say 200 million years ago, this is what our Earth looked like. This is what they show right here. Uh, I guess they've, Asia should be up here, but I guess they just didn't label it. I guess Europe takes center stage there in a British production, but anyway, yeah. The continents arranged like this. Here is a more modern reconstruction of what that would look like. Pangaea. This is around the time of the... This is when dinosaurs are really first taking over the Earth. They'd evolved about 60 million years before this, maybe? For the very first time? But 200 million years ago? Or no, hang on. No, sorry. Dinosaurs first show up about 40 million years before this. About 240 million years ago. This is about 200 million years ago. So you have North America, South America, Africa. India is right here. Australia, Antarctica. Uh, Madagascar is wedged in there as well. And Europe and Asia. Over here, one big continuous landmass. When the first dinosaurs evolved and started to spread out across the globe, you can pretty much walk just about anywhere. That's one factor in the dinosaurs' tremendous success is when they first evolved, they could spread out easily across the globe. I guess that's also true for mammals, but because mammals evolved around the same time. But uh, mammals didn't really do much of anything interesting for the first 160 million years of their existence. So yeah, yeah. Anyway. So much land, says Raveland. Well, I mean, on the other side, look. No land. It's all water on the other side. So, yeah. Um, the big supercontinent with all of these land masses joined together we call Pangaea. And then, conversely, on the other side of the planet, there's no land. We call that Panthalassa. All ocean. Pangaea, all Earth. Panthalassa, all Ocean. But yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how New World Primates got to the New World? Little Uzi Nate? 
Probably rafting. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. That old lottery system. There's actually a, a neat discussion of that in this book right here. Beasts of Eden by David Raines Wallace. I am, I've got like two pages left in this book. Um, but I would highly recommend it if you're, uh, if you're interested in the evolution of mammals. And the history of the study of the evolution of mammals. That is an excellent, excellent book. David Raines Wallace, Beasts of Eden. So anyway, Synthberry says there was a frozen land bridge from Russia to North America. That was way later, Synthberry, yeah. So you're talking about... Uh, well, it's not even on here. But you're talking about the Bering Land Bridge. That's way after the origin of, uh, of New World Primates. But that's how things like mammoths and people came to uh, North America from Asia. Yeah. There we go. The Bering Land Bridge. So, yeah. When a lot of Earth's water was, uh, you know, locked up in ice, sea levels were lower. And so that combined with big areas of ice frozen water, you could basically walk across what is today the Bering Strait. And you could go from Russia to Alaska, and vice versa. Uh, that's much more recent than... It would have been tens of millions of years ago, I think, that the, the New World primates found their way across uh, back when there wasn't a land bridge. Does that make sense? Yeah. Take that, Henry the Navigator. There you go, said Barry, yeah. <laughs> uh... Yeah, 560 for hardcover. Go with the hardcover, Bliss Nine. Yeah, shoot. But yeah, yeah. Uh, anywho, let's get back to our video before I get too too distracted here. Yeah. Africa and India are both next to South America, and yep. Britain and Europe far closer to North America than they are today. So although all of the countries were around then, they were in very different places. Since the age of the dinosaurs, the main land areas of the world, the continents, have gradually been drifting apart. True. It's taken millions of years to do so. Yep. But today's world, of course, now looks like this. We live now in a period called the Quaternary, and it's lasted for about one million years. And although sure. it seems a very long time to us, it's actually just a very short time in the total life history of the world. So we've got our first musical number here. Feel free to jam out. Is this still super quiet for you? Because it's like, it's almost too loud for my ear, but I'll turn it up a little bit. There we go. If we go back 10 million years, however, we find ourselves in a very different period. We find ourselves in the tertiary age. This yeah. was the time when most of the plants and animals that we know today... So we no longer really call it the tertiary. Uh, this terminology has changed. I'll show you. Show you what I mean here. Excuse me. Actually, that should be like that. Yeah. So the Neogene and Paleogene, these used to be combined into the Tertiary. Nowadays, we subdivide them. And let's make that linear right there. There we go. Paleogene and Neogene. We used to call these the Tertiary. The Quaternary is still the... That's the last remnants of this, like, sequential old order. It used to be primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. First, second, third, and fourth. The Mesozoic era, we used to call the secondary era. But it wasn't a very useful term. It wasn't really specific enough, so it's changed. Anyway, now the tertiary is the Neogene and the Paleogene, if that makes sense. Yeah. And uh, the author of Beasts of Eden is David Raines Wallace, Darian Beagle. David Raines Wallace. Yeah. Anywho, uh, let's continue. We find ourselves in a very different period. We find ourselves in the tertiary age. How's the volume now? Is it good? This was the time when most of the plants and animals that we know today were just about starting to develop. The tertiary age goes back as far as 65 million years ago. And further than that, we begin to enter another age. <laughs> The Mesozoic Age. The age of the dinosaurs and their ancestors. <laughs> I 
during the Mesozoic age. The uh, the still hard. To, it's like my my ear physically hurts. This is so weird. I don't know why you can't hear it there. Um, let's turn it up here. And is the music is the music too loud now? Let me know. Because I used to be able to run the music and the desktop audio, the music and the uh, the audio from videos on the same slider, but the music is too loud. Well, let's see, when I turn it down, everybody's going to say the video is too quiet now. Uh, um, how's the music now after having reset it? Is that a, is that a comfortable volume for everybody? Let me know. Good. Okay. Now for this, I guess let me just, I can adjust the volume here in the browser with my volume master extension. But I feel like it's going to get blown out. I don't know. Tell me if it's okay now. The weather was rather warmer than it is today. Is that better? As we have seen, the countries of the world were all much closer together. And so there was very little difference between the different seasons. Good. As a result, all okay. kinds of plant life could grow all very loud to me. in very hot conditions to provide food and shelter for all kinds of weird and wonderful animals. Including <laughs> bad course, illustrations, oh man. The dinosaurs. Uh. Just look at them. Did you ever see such wicked eyes? <sighs> Did you ever see such fearsome teeth? <sighs> Did you ever see such a terrible face? Well, uh, here, I beg your pardon? A crocodile? What are you doing here? What do you mean, what am I doing here? This is where I live. But you're not a dinosaur. You're a... You're, you're a crocodile. Well, well, all right. If you want to get technical, I'm not a real dinosaur. But me and all the other <laughs> crocodiles in the world... Not even technical. I mean... Crocodiles are not dinosaurs. They're, they're related to dinosaurs, and I think... I think he may be about to sing a song about that. But, uh... Yeah, yeah. Anywho. For a, you're, you're a crocodile. Well, well, all right, if you want to get technical, I'm not a real dinosaur. Oh, no, hang on. <clears throat> I'll tell you another way. <laughs> well, thank you, Amish Andy. Appreciate those 17 months of, su of support there. Thank you, thank you, Amish Andy. Yeah. Happy 17 months. Thank you, Amish Andy. Jeff Bezos money. Thank you, thank you for using that Prime to support Science Outreach here on Twitch. Amish Andy, I appreciate that sincerely and earnestly. Thank you, thank you, Andy. That's wonderful. Here, let's, uh, let's let him jump in a song here. Yeah. But me and all the other crocodiles in the world are descended from the same group of animals as the dinosaurs. That's Most true. Archosaurs. During the age of the dinosaurs, in fact, <clears throat> I remember my great 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 grandfather telling me that his great 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 grandmother said she could remember them quite clearly. So you know all about them. Anything you want to know, I'm your man, or rather, I'm your croc. Because man didn't arrive on the scene until much later, as you know. Much, but much later. The name descended from chaps like this Teleosaurus. Ooh, those fearsome looking set of teeth lurking down there on the <laughs> riverbank. But this is amazing. Do you mean to tell me that all the crocodiles in the world are directly related to the dinosaurs? That's what I was trying to say. That my Yeah, and uh, Claire Burr says they need to remake this with a bird. They totally could, Claire Burr, and that would be even more direct than... Uh... You know, having a crocodile sing a song about this. Partly because, you know, birds can actually sing and, and they're direct descendants of dinosaurs. Let me show you what I mean, though. Um, yeah, I think... Uh, that's what we want. Yeah. So this is what we call a phylogeny. Long-time viewers of this channel... Shoot, you've seen this a million times, but I'm going to show you one more time real quick, especially for anybody who's fairly new around here. This is what we call a phylogeny. Phylogeny. That's just an evolutionary family tree. And so this whole group here, all of these, are called archosaurs. 
Archosaurs are the ruling reptiles. This is dinosaurs and their relatives. You see, crocodiles are up here. Dinosaurs start off right here. So everything that descended from this ancestor is a dinosaur. Crocodiles are kind of like cousins to the dinosaurs. You know, if we could zoom way, way out, you could fit every animal that's ever lived, every living thing that's ever lived on a tree like this. But we're zoomed way into Archosauria, which starts right here. Let's change our color. So this is Archosauria in blue. Archosauria. So dinosaurs and crocodilians are both a kind of archosaur. So dinosaurs are related to crocodiles, but crocodiles are not dinosaurs. They're like cousins to dinosaurs, if that makes sense. Yeah. And uh, Rila Rolo says, thanks, I'm new. Welcome, Rila Rolo. Good to have you here. Yeah. And the, the puppet is not lying. Listen to his song, Eschaton. Listen to his song. He will, uh, he'll tell you all about it. Here we go. Uh... My yeah. great 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 for that gift to Rilo Rolo. Really appreciate that, Safarix. Thank you, thank you. Look, we're at four out of 40 now. One tenth of the way there. And hang on, my 3D printer is making some noises. Let me make sure nothing is horribly obstructed on this. It's making crinkling sounds. I will be right back. There we go. That's better. Ugh. Finicky sometimes. These things get finicky. But yeah. Yeah. Anywho, let's uh, have this crocodile sing us a song, Tell shall we? All the crocodiles in the world are directly related to the dinosaurs. That's yep. what I was trying to say. That my great, 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 great. Oh, no, hang on. <clears throat> I'll tell Certainly, there are many more dinosaurs waiting to be discovered. Thank you, Rilo Rolo. Mysteries waiting to be pondered. Thanks for the follow. Welcome. I'll tell you another way. About 250. I like the disco lighting. So this is like a basal archosaur right here. Sorry to interrupt. Echidontian. Yeah. We don't really use that term much anymore, Thekodonchon. Hmm. Looks worried. You can tell by the snap of our jaw. You can tell by the way we go hunting at night And the way that we stun with our tail when we fight Oh, I could tell you so much more hmm. I'm related to a dinosaur You know, science documentaries could use more musical numbers like this. I'm, I'm gonna say it now. Uh. <laughs> oh, I could tell you so much more Oh, man. Well, we lay eggs just like hens do. <laughs> we live in rivers and swamps, and we can run faster than the average man when we're out <laughs> of the water and we're on the dry land. Oh, I could tell you so much more how I'm related to a dinosaur. Yeah, I. This whole song could be. You could take this and you could like. You could put it over some footage of Elton John singing, and it could be really funny. So, cro and uh, crocodiles, if they're fighting against the predator, they can stun with their tail, I suppose. Um, yeah, I don't know. They'll like they'll smack things with their tail, just like the iguana did that, that we saw short uh, short while ago. 
Yeah. Um. Anyway, it's not something I do all that often. You know, they're not like specially adapted for that, but they'll do it. Um. Yeah. Like my maps do while I'm trying to. Oh, sorry, Gimplag. Shoot. <laughs> Uh, Safarex, eh, that could be cool. Prehistoric Planet 2. Electric Boogaloo. Uh. PG Tips. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Uh. Crocodiles and dinosaurs are both descended from the same ancestor. As the yep. song says, that fierce old Thecodontian. According mm -hmm. to the reference book, there are something like 800 different kinds of dinosaur. How on earth can you remember them all? You see... Well, yeah, maybe probably a third of those were valid. I, I don't know. There are like a few hundred valid dinosaurs back in the beginning of the 1980s. Now there's easily, we have easily over a thousand, maybe approaching, depending on how you count them, between a thousand and two thousand different uh, dinosaur genera that have been named. It's a lot. It's definitely a lot. Whilst my side of the family was busy developing into crocodiles, the dinosaurs were all busy developing into different types. What on earth do you mean, Dill? I'm sorry. Well, I... Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I can't tell you much more at the moment. Something's come up. And it looks very much like a Brachiosaurus to me. So who's that with it? That's a Thecodontosaurus. Let's hope neither of them saw us. Shh, shh, and pay attention because these two are the biggest and the smallest members of one of the different dinosaur groups I was telling you all about. They're the largest and the smallest of the plodding dinosaurs. Sauropods. Yeah. What does valid mean in this context? Valid just means that they are... They're valid taxa. They are... Like, it is actually its own kind of dinosaur. It's not the same as something else. Um, because sometimes, like, one kind of dinosaur will accidentally get given two different names. Sometimes people look at really small differences between two different skeletons and they'll go, hey, shoot, that must mean they're different taxa entirely. They're different genera or different species based on really subtle differences. It's like, no. Ontogeny. There's a lot of other things that can cause, uh, there you go, like ontogeny, Golgonek. Things like ontogeny or individual variation or stratigraphic variation that can cause variation in morphology. Um, so valid just means that, like, yes, this is definitely... Its own kind of dinosaur, different from everything else. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's valid in that it's like, it's legit. I, I guess you could use the word legit in place of valid. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the question, Swoobo. And yeah, the most British pun ever. I know, right, Safarex? Here, let's go back. Yeah. are the biggest and the smallest members of one of the different dinosaur groups I was telling you all about. Hmm. They're the largest and the smallest of the plodding dinosaurs. Sauropods. We've got a new sauropods command, too. Now, these two, on the other hand, are the biggest and smallest of the bird-footed dinosaurs. The big ones are Shantungasaurus. Uh, it's not Shantungasaurus. That's clearly like a Pachycephalosaurus. Um... Silhouette right there. Shantungasaurus is a huge duck build dinosaur. It really is really, really big. Uh, there we go. Shantungasaurus size. These animals got enormous. Just truly gargantuan. Um, just stunningly large. Yeah. Just that skull is, like, probably as tall as you are. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so this is an, an ornithopod. The bird-footed dinosaurs. But for some reason, they had a Pachycephalosaurus silhouette there. Don't know why. And the little one's got an even longer name. Micropachycephalosaurus. <laughs> They're just two out of scores of bird-footed dinosaurs. Micro means small, doesn't it, Dill? That's right. But you need a big breath to say it. <gasps> Get your head down. Here come the killer dinosaurs, and that could mean real trouble. Theropods. The worst of the lot, the Tyrannosaurus. And the smallest is that chicken-sized little monster, the Comsognathus. Because most of the These are terrible silhouettes. Oh, man. They dined only on plants and leaves. But some really were meat-eating monsters that would kill anything that got in their way. I think this is from, uh... 
Now these two are much more. That was from uh, the land that time forgot, wasn't it? Or the people that time forgot, or one of the sequels. Anyway, yeah. Plants and leaves, but some really were meat-eating monsters that would kill anything that got. Ceratosaurus, sir. Now these two are much more friendly towards me, at any rate. <laughs> They're the Stegosaurus and the little Struthiosaurus from the armored dinosaur side of the family. Yeah, Thyreophorans. Oh yes. They could take care of themselves all right, even though they preferred quite a peaceful life. These two look familiar. And so they should be, because they were among the very last of the dinosaurs. Triceratops is the big one, and the hmm. little one in front of him is Microceratops. This is an interesting kind of, like, thing that they've going, got going on here, where they show, they try and show the largest and the smallest members of these different groups. Um, it kind of reminds me of... Uh, This. I would love to see an updated version of this done. This is from the Zoo Books Dinosaurs. Here's my hardcover copy. Got this a while ago because I like to show it a lot on stream. But this is from uh, from the 80s right here. Wonderful illustrations by Mark Hallett. But yeah, these are different groups of dinosaurs. Come on. Autofocus, you can do it. Goodness, but there's uh, the theropods right there, meat eating dinosaurs. Come on. Theropods right here. And then we've got the prosauropods up here and the sauropods here. We now group these together. Um, we've got Thyreophorans, Stegosaurs, and Ankylosaurs. No Scolitosaurus in there, though. Should have that, too. And then the Ornithopods. And the funny thing is, they've stuck Pachycephalosaurus in with the Ornithopods, the bird-footed dinosaurs. Duckbill dinosaurs and Iguanodontians. And Pachycephalosaurus doesn't belong there. Pachycephalosaurus actually belongs with Ceratopsians over in Marginocephalia. Anyway, it's kind of remarkable how well these illustrations have held up. Um, because when was this first published? Let me check. But it was, I think, a good while ago. I want to say in the late 80s? Um, not 2003. Goodness. Somebody look up Zoo Books Dinosaurs and see when that came out. Um... Yeah. Anywho. But I guess the hardcover version is 2003. It's exactly the same as the original. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, rookie mistake. Here you go, Lilithobo. Yeah. So, anyway, it's kind of cool. Like, this idea... I wonder if any of these have actually changed since then. Like, uh... Like, the biggest and smallest of these different groups... Um, sauropods? Shh, shh, and pay attention, because these two are the biggest and the smallest members of one of the different dinosaur groups I was telling you. So, Brachiosaurus and Thecodontosaurus. I guess the biggest sauropod that we have today might be, it's probably some kind of Titanosaur. Patagotitan or Argentinosaurus, maybe. Uh, maybe Alamosaurus, depending on who you ask. Yeah. Uh, and the smallest of the sauropods might be one of those dwarf sauropods, one of the dwarf titanosaurs from the Cretaceous of Europe. Um, oh no, it might be somebody like Mosaurus or Saturnalia, perhaps? Probably Saturnalia, actually. That's a good bet. Um, They're the, on the other hand, are the big for the ornithopods. The ornithopod Shantungosaurus might still be the biggest. That or Edmontosaurus anectens. And then little Frutidens might be uh, might be the smallest of the ornithopod dinosaurs, unless it's more of a basal ornithischian. I guess it depends on, uh, on how you count it. There's Luis Chiappe right there holding a model of Frutidens. Not a big animal, you know. It's about chicken sized, size of a big chicken, but a chicken nonetheless. Yeah. 
No, yeah. Yeah. And then for our next group... Tyrannus. Yeah, so... Biggest theropod would be probably Spinosaurus nowadays. Tyrannosaurus is still right up there, though. Very, very large. And then Compsognathus is no longer considered the smallest of the theropods. It would probably be something like Epidexipteryx or Scansoreopteryx or something like that. Yeah. Put feathers on it. Yeah. It does does deserve some feathers. Yeah. Um... And Claire says, I think it was 86. Original run of zoo books was from 1985 to 1987. Yeah. And tactile. Maybe I'll do that tomorrow, tactile. I, uh... Yeah, we gotta get through this, you know? <laughs> but I appreciate you, tactile. I do. Um... Yeah, I'll, uh... I'll take a look later. The smallest yeah. is that chicken-sized little monster. They died anyway, here world. we go. It was me the dinosaur side of the family. They look quite well protected. Oh, yeah. These... Try yeah. these last dinosaurs because they live right at the very end of the Mesozoic age, in the light green Cretaceous period, remember? So they were some of the dinosaurs that could have been wiped out at the end of the dinosaur age. I'm afraid so, but don't feel too sad. Remember that you've seen all the main dinosaurs for over 140 million years. Plodders, bird-footed, fighting, armored, and the ceratopsians. The last dinosaurs all in the space of three minutes. And each one of these different groups could contain anything up to almost a hundred different dinosaurs. More. So way more now, yeah. The plodding dinosaurs, the first of my dinosaur dozen. They were never too quick off the mark. Hmm. Uh, Ewa Lynx says, can we tell from fossils about cold versus warm-blooded? Or in between? We can, Ewa Lynx, yeah. We've got a number of different ways of looking at dinosaur metabolism. You can look at the histology of the bone, see how quickly the bones are growing. You can do, like, chemical analyses of the bones to figure out, like, how much oxygen they would require which gives you some clues about metabolism, all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah, even like feathers on dinosaurs show that these animals would have been warm-blooded because, you know, animals that don't generate their own body heat generally don't have fur or feathers. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, all right, see you in a bit, Ladina. Yeah. The dinosaur dozen plodders. So that's interesting. They're calling sauropods the plodding dinosaurs. Okay. They might more commonly be referred to by regular folks as, like, long neck dinosaurs. But we as paleontologists call them sauropods. Yeah. Yeah. Sauropods. There you go, Claire. Yeah. Now here are some most very strange dinosaur names. Try to say them out loud and then say them again. Diplodocus, Volcanodon, and Plateosaurus, Iguanodon, Deinonychus, and Tyrannosaurus, Triceratops, Ilophysis, and Hyperion, Art. With Taurosaurus, Stegosaurus, that's about enough of them. <gasps> Baby Dinosaurus. Yeah. Thicodontosaurus. It's, it's Thicodontosaurus. What? I spelled that wrong. Thicodontosaurus. Yeah. Masospondylus. Volcanodon. Platiosaurus, <laughs> Riojosaurus, Cetiosaurus, Brachiosaurus, Patosaurus, yeah. Doctor Javasaurus. I mean, shoot! If I could get the chords for this song, I could learn how to play it on the uke. Supersaurus. Oh, did you catch Diplodocus right there? Told you it would be making some appearances. Diplodocus. Supersaurus. Well, Dill, you know them all personally so much better than I do. Which of the dinosaurs is your favorite? Well, since you ask, I must admit, I've always had a bit of a soft spot for the plodders, the brontosaurs. They've always seemed to me mm, to be exactly what a dinosaur should be. None of mm. them rushing about, just slow and stately, plodding from one place to another. And for someone like me, who can barely reach more than three feet off the ground, just imagine the kind of view you'd get if you were a giant brontosaurus. And I guess we've got another musical number here. Um, yeah, but before that, Elwell Link says it does. So our old view about mostly cold-blooded is out, or just for some branches. Most dinosaurs, it seems, were probably warm-blooded. And even the ones that would have been, had slower metabolisms, I, uh, it would be a stretch to call them, like, cold-blooded. Um, I don't know. I think if you were to talk to most dinosaur paleontologists, they would tell you that 
most dinosaurs were, to oversimplify it, warm-blooded. Yeah. So that old picture of cold-blooded, slow-moving, dumb, reptilian, sluggish dinosaurs, that's completely gone now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's the dinosaur I'd like to be. And Claire Burt, thank you. City Patty, we will do that in a little bit. I yeah. had been born a dinosaur. Hmm. I'd be <laughs> the most gigantic size and almost as wide as a house I would be. But I. <laughs> Okay. And live peacefully if I were a dinosaur rather than me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there you go, astronomy show, yeah. I had been a dinosaur. My neck would be extremely long So I could eat leaves from very high trees As well as small plants on the ground near my knees Your knees <laughs> That is actually kind of interesting. We do know, think that uh, that's the wrong kind of footprints for a sauropod. But we do think that a lot of sauropods would have been ground level feeders now. It's not necessarily that they're using those necks to browse from the tops of trees. Many of them, like Diplodocus or Apatosaurus, they were probably grazing at ground level. And just kind of using those necks for sweeping in a wide arc so they could feed really efficiently rather than you know, having to take steps, you know, to get to each plant. They could just plant their feet in one place, swing that long neck across in a wide sweeping arc, and just gobble up all the plants like that. Uh, really efficient way of feeding. So sweep feeding, there you go, Clever. yeah, yeah. Well, as you can see, despite all my high-flying ideas, I've had to come down to Earth again. Mind you, it is a very special kind of Earth because it was here in this Sussex quarry, just an hour or so's journey from London, that the hmm. first dinosaur to be identified by man was found. That's because Megalosaurus. over 100 million years ago, back in the Mesozoic age, the age of the dinosaurs, there were all kinds of crocodiles and dinosaurs living here where Britain is. <laughs> That's right. Dinosaurs were right here in England. Mind you, it all, all over the world. different today, yeah. though. Just as it did when Dr. and Mrs. Mantell <laughs> first came across the scene back in 1822. Dr. Mantell had come to visit a patient of his just along the road. And as it was such a beautifully warm summer's day, his wife Mary had come along for a ride. Well, she didn't want to be bothered with looking over her husband's shoulder all the time, so off she went for a short walk. Barely had she begun, and her attention was drawn to the middle of a pile of rubble being used to mend the road. Cheers. For there, in the middle of a pile of rough sandstone, was the oddest-looking stone she had ever seen. Can I just say, I love these little reenactments like this. This is really nice. Uh, even if it's a little bit hokey, it's entertaining. And to me, it kind of makes me happy as, as a dinosaur paleontologist that somebody actually went through the trouble of, like, Hiring actors to like reenact this this scene from the very beginnings of dinosaur paleontology, it's uh, it's pretty cool, it really is, and uh, and it's nice to see uh, Mary Mantell, you know, getting some credit for her discovery here too, you know, yeah. It was dark brown and shiny, with a smooth polished surface. Hmm. And as she looked at it more closely, she suddenly realized what it was. The dark brown stone she was holding was a giant tooth, and there were many more crushed together in the sandstone nearby. Look at 
she rushed to tell her husband of her amazing find. There could be teeth. Where did you <laughs> find them? Down the lane. And together, they traced the source of the mysterious giant teeth back to a local sandstone quarry. Hmm. Now, although Dr. Mantell and his wife knew that what they had found were fossils, animal bones that had been in the ground so long that they had turned to stone, neither of them knew for certain the name of the animal the teeth had come from. What do you mean, knew the uh, name? <laughs> it didn't have a name yet. It's new. This was hardly surprising, for ever since the 17th century, people have been finding strange bones and fossils in the soil and stones of the south of England. Some thought them to be the remains of a race of giants that once lived in the area. <laughs> Others believe them to be uh, all that was left of a mythological collection of devils, dragons, and fairy tale monsters. Mm. Well, the Mantells knew a little more than that. They remembered barely a dozen years earlier a girl called Mary Anning, who yeah, lived in the time another Mary. Dorset in southern England. Mary Anning. If there is anyone in the history of paleontology, who is just universally revered by paleontologists, amongst other it would be Mary Anning. Mary Anning is, she's like the patron saint of paleontologists, if if that makes any sense. Um, I don't know if it does. Anyway, uh, as a paleontologist, all paleontologists just have the, the utmost respect and adoration for Mary Anning. Um, yeah, yeah. We might do a special celebration for Mary Anning's birthday again this year, like we did last year. We'll have to see. Yeah. She had found, amongst other fossils, the complete fossilized remains of a prehistoric fish lizard, the Ichthyosaurus. Fish lizard. It's a marine reptile. It's not a fish. Yeah. Although the word Ichthyosaur does mean fish lizard. It's... Yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> and, uh... Hello, Jody Fish. Because Dr. Mantell knew that like the Lias rock that Mary Anning had Hello. her fossils in, the sandstone rocks surrounding the teeth were very old, going back almost 100 million years, he knew that the teeth must have come from the same period of prehistoric time. But how could a thing as solid as a tooth find its way into something as solid as a rock? The answer hmm. is that when the tooth first fell into the rock, the rock wasn't rock at all, but simply a layer of rather sandy mud lying at the bottom of a stream or a swamp. I, <laughs> I love this. Seems to me seems completely, completely unnecessary. So it makes me laugh. But here is a demonstration of um, how you can get the shape of a thing in a rock by making an imprint. Like, I guess maybe a producer said, oh, you need to have some sort of a hands-on demonstration or something like that for kids to watch. But uh, yeah, it fell into the rock. There you go, not the brain. Oh boy, yeah. But how could a thing as solid as a tooth find its way into something as solid as a rock? The answer is that when the tooth first fell into the rock, the rock wasn't rock at all, but mm. simply a layer of rather sandy mud lying at the bottom of a stream or a swamp. You can see exactly what happens if you pour plaster into a dish and then drop a chicken bone into it. <laughs> the plaster gradually traps the chicken bone in the same way that the mud gradually settled around the dinosaur bones. Then as time went on, more layers of mud formed on top of the bone and it gradually became covered. Of course. The sandstone rock took millions of years to set properly. Our plaster mix, on the other hand, should be set solid in a very short time. Then, millions of years after the rock had been covered by more and more layers of new rock, certain parts were slowly weathered away by the wind and sea to expose the old bones. Forbidden in this case, soup. the process there you go. has only taken a few minutes. Now you can split open your rock, Dill, to find your original bone. <laughs> wow. And that's exactly what Mary Anning and the Mantells had to do okay. to split open their fossil finds. <laughs> Except that they were dealing with much harder rocks and stuff. Uh. That's right. And there's another important difference, too. You see, we know exactly what's inside our fossil, but Dr. Mantell and the other early fossil hunters were not at all sure where the bones they had found had come from. 
One sunny spring day in 1822 in the little Sussex town of Lewis. Another musical number. A young lady wife was out of walking one day, just enjoying her life. What did she see? <laughs> there on the ground, something dark and shiny and brown. It was the very first tooth of a dinosaur. The very first tooth that was found. Well, time <laughs> went by, more teeth and bones were found. But nobody knew quite what they were. There was much speculation as to what they could be. And Dr. Mantle and his wife said, oh, dear me. What have we taken out of the ground? Perhaps we should have left things alone. <laughs> no. We've never seen anything like these before. Just what do we make of these bones? Was it a great big dog? Was it a fierce old giant? That's a now giraffe. Will we ever know? <laughs> Perhaps an elephant. No, that can't be right. Maybe a fiery dragon that's a whale. Well, we've wrecked our brains. There's Dippy, the Diplodocus. Perhaps we should have left things alone. Oh, what is the answer? A prehistoric monster. Well, Iguanodon. What do we make of these bones? Was it a great big dog? Was it a fierce old giant? Now, how uh, will we ever know? No, 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 no. Perhaps an elephant. No, that can't be right. Maybe a fiery dragon that set things alone. A whale. Well, we've wrecked our brains and we still don't know. <laughs> Perhaps we should have left things alone. Oh, you hey, travel, how you doing? <laughs> so how's your fossil coming along then, Dill? Oh, I'll show you. There you are. You know, all the same though, Dill, most people would find it pretty hard to imagine what a complete chicken would look like if they only had a fossilized chicken bone to go on. Well, that's mm. the problem Dr. Mantell had. He'd found the teeth all right, but it wasn't until nine years later, in 1831, that he finally discovered a complete skeleton. It wasn't anywhere cl close to complete. Um, there was still just a handful of bones. And our picture of Iguanodon would only change. It would become more authentic, you know, closer to, to reality after complete skeletons were found in Belgium decades later. But yeah. Then he could see for the first time ever what kind of an animal the fossilized teeth had come from. And what it would have looked like back in the Mesozoic age. I hate to say this, Dill, but you know, Dr. Mantell's strange fossilized creature has come out looking more than a little like you. <laughs> of course it does. That's why he called it an Iguanodon. Iguanodon. After a fierce Iguana lizard... <laughs> I like that. That's why he called it the Iguanodon. And then he, in the background, he goes, Iguanodon. Let's watch that again. That's why he called it an Iguanodon. Iguanodon. <laughs> I don't know why that makes me laugh. <laughs> of course it does. That's why he called it an Iguanodon. Iguanodon. <laughs> That needs to be an alert too. Um, let me uh, let me make a note of that. Yeah. Where is that here? Yeah, I can find the exact timestamp. There we go. Yeah. Anyway, appreciate your patience, everybody. Uh, After a fierce iguana lizard iguana. that lived in South America. Very fierce. Dogs, meaning teeth. A real dinosaur? <laughs> Uber Archer, thank you for the follow and welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. It yeah. wasn't until several years later that people first began to realize that the Iguanodon was just one of the prehistoric reptiles called the dinosaurs. The name dinosaur means terrible lizard. And by the time... Terrible, not terrible is in the sense that we're like, oh, that's lousy. What a lousy lizard. That's garbage. That's dog water. No, terrible in the sense like... Like great and terrible. Like Oz the Great and Terrible or whatever. You know, the terrible power. Terrible, like, fearfully great. It's basically like the Victorian equivalent of the word awesome, I suppose. So, yeah. Terrible lizards, or fearfully great lizards, awesome lizards, awesome reptiles. 
you know, these things don't always translate exactly from Latinized Greek into modern English. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway. The time that the word dinosaur first came into common use, all kinds of people have been busy working out their own ideas of what the Iguanodon would have looked like in real life. <laughs> this is a model <laughs> specially made for the Crystal <laughs> Palace grounds in London in 1854. He's completely the wrong shape. His yep. colors are all wrong. And as for the spiky horn on his nose... We don't know if the colors are all wrong. What? We don't know what colors Iguanodon was. Really, you're going to harp on that? Not the posture or their proportions? Uh, completely the wrong shape. His colors are all wrong. And as for the that. spiky horn on his nose, well, yeah. even Dr. Mantell got that wrong. This is where it really fits. Yep. And I'm, I like this, uh, that should be an alert too, shoot. Got that wrong. Yeah. This is where it really fits. Blink, blink, blink. The people have made... <laughs> this is actually what I'm 3D printing right now. Let's take a look. Uh, here are two of the fingers right there. I am printing an iguanodon hand currently. And uh, let me show you how much of it I have done. Yeah. This is big. The hand of Iguanodon is not to be trifled with. Holy moly. So this is the exact specimen that I'm printing. This is how much of it I have currently. Uh, this other finger, this is the ring finger right here. Goes like that. This is gonna be big. Um, there we go, like that, and then we're gonna have the carpals and the, uh, radius and ulna coming off of that. And then here's the pinky finger, it's gonna come off somewhere like that. Pinky finger just finished printing yesterday. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Right now, I am printing, I think, these two. These two fingers right here, I think? Yeah, it's gonna be these. Um, so yeah, yeah, shoot. After that, it's just the radius and ulna. And uh, part of the thumb spike. And then we'll be all set. Yeah, not small indeed. No, especially Iguanodon bernis artensis. This is the Belgian Iguanodon. It's big, it's got big chunky hands. It's, it's a big animal, holy moly. And as for the spiky horn on his yeah. nose, well, even Dr. Mantell got that wrong. This is where it really fits. The people of Maidstone in Kent, near where the Iguanodon was found, were so pleased with it that they decided to put old Iggy here into their town's coat of arms. Yep. Today, of course, we now know that the Iguanodon that Dr. Mantell discovered was only one of a whole family of bird-footed dinosaurs. Yeah, ornithopods. About dinosaur dozens. <clears throat> Dinosaur doesn't. Bird footed. That's what the word ornithopod means is bird footed. So that's that's a fair nickname. Yeah. Now here yeah. they are. Once again, those dinosaur names. There you go, Raven, yeah. Raven, sorry. That could be an alert too, I guess. Yeah. Lesothosaurus. That's an ornithopod. Hypsilophodon. Yeah. Pachycephalosaurus. Pachycephalosaurus is not an ornithopod. It's not. It's not at all. Pachycephalosaurus is more closely related to the the horned dinosaurs. It's a it's a marginocephalian dinosaur. I don't know if we ever thought that it was related to ornithopods, did we? Shoot. I guess it was before my time. Again, this is from 1982. This information that they're using for it is probably from the 1970s. Were they really thought to be ornithopods back then? That's wild. I'll have to look that up. But uh, anyway, now we know that these guys, pachycephalosaurs, I'll show you a more uh, modern representation. And, uh, just, 
Let's see. Um, anytime I do this, by the way. Anytime I, uh, you know, I take time to show you, like, oh, well, you know, that's not right. It's actually like this. It's not, you know, I'm not trying to go, uh, you know, open image, a new tab. I'm not trying to go, well, well, actually, you know, they, they look like this, and this is inaccurate, and the data should, like, what I'm trying to do is go, hey, the reality for dinosaurs is so much cooler than, you know, these old-fashioned incorrect representations. Dinosaurs are incredibly cool, you know, on their own. That's why it is so exciting to find out new information about them, because they always invariably end up being way cooler in reality than anything that we could come up with in fiction, you know? So here's Pachycephalosaurus there, and here is an excellent Pachycephalosaurus render. This is from the game Saurian, and this is one of the best depictions I've seen anywhere of Pachycephalosaurus. Really, really awesome. Uh, such a cool animal. You know, a uh, friend and colleague Kerry Woodruff just finished his PhD on Pachycephalosaurus. And they are far weirder and more interesting than anybody realizes. And I'm really excited to, uh, to talk with him about that and share some of that information with you once it gets published. So, uh, yeah, that tail, I know, right? Might be something interesting going on with that tail. And, uh, and four toes. Yeah, the Halix might actually contact the ground there, Jody Fish. Yeah. Yeah. And Golganek. There's something definitely interesting going on with their tails. We'll talk about that another time. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Such cool animals. Very, very neat critters. Yeah, Friar Tuck, there you go, Dither. <laughs> yes, you know what? Shoot, now that I've got, uh, yeah. Um... Let's see. <laughs> uh, turn our volume up. Um, here we go. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, yeah. Can you hear any of that, by the way? Do I need to do some serious, like, re, uh, rejiggering of the audio? Yeah, and, uh, Pete Postlethwaite, yeah, there you go, Lilith Elbow, yep, yep. And it was high volume. That's so weird, because it was really quiet to me. I could barely hear it, even after turning it away. I bet you I'll restart OBS tomorrow. Everything will be fine. Anyway, yeah, my sound is all haywire today, Claire Burr. But I appreciate everybody's patience about that. Anyway, Pachycephalosaurus. It's a marginocephalian. It's related to the horned dinosaurs. It's not an ornithopod. But, uh, yeah. Saurus. Proserolophus. Hadrosaurus. Uh. Paxosaurus. I really, I really dislike these illustrations. Notice how they're all kind of muddy looking and green or brown, you know? Oh, it's a terrible iguanodon. Ugh! Ugh! Oh, goodness. Let me show you a decent iguanodon. Iguanodon Baroness Artensis. There is a beautiful iguanodon. By Gabriel Ugueto, right there. Very talented paleo artist. Look at those big beefy hands. Holy cow. I'm so excited for this to be done. That's... Oh, man. Yeah, dang. Look at him, right, pizza guy? Absolute unit. You know? Iguanodon Bernis Artensis. What a remarkable creature. 
Uh, it's an iguanodonchi in the size of an elephant, you know? Um, yeah, with those meat mitts. Yep. That critter could KO a Volvo truck. Oh, yeah, Dr. Javasaurus. And look at those thumb spikes. Holy cow. And maybe not a slap fighter astronomy show. But, uh, more of a... Hmm, it's got more of a... A shiv, a spike, a dagger? I don't know. A dagger, let's call it that. Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, in the Jurassic World Evolution game, I guess this is how the Iguanodon defends itself? Yeah, which that's actually maybe pretty close to the truth. I mean, it, ugh, God, it hurts to watch. Ugh. Just, ugh. <laughs> ugh. Ugh. Anyway, yeah. Um, so yeah, you, you would not want to mess with this animal. Certainly not. Uh, it's not really a stiletto. That thing is a full-on hellbeard. I mean, it's it's conical in cross-section. It's like a giant ice cream cone of death with the pointy part sticking up, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Raven says, I love them now. Aren't they cool? Iguanodon is such a cool animal. And thank you, Anomalous Symmetry, for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Yeah, uh, that is a good name. You're right, Claire. And thank you for the hydrate there, Solemnus. In fact, I'm going to have to go get some more water. This ice is not melting fast enough. We're okay for now. But yeah. Don't forget, these guys didn't live by themselves. One gets stabby, they probably all get stabby. Yeah, these were probably animals that lived in herds. They probably lived in groups. They would look out for each other. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, yeah, cool critters. Iguanodon, or here it is here. They really did not do it justice there. <laughs> did my boy dirty. Uh, oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> uh, Parasaurolophus, Lambiosaurus, Iguanodon. Oh, look! Look how they've murdered my boy. <laughs> now they look how how they massacred my boy. What's the line from Godfather? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Shantungosaurus. Dr. Mantell's Iguanodon. Did you spot him in the dinosaur dozen? He was just the first of the dinosaurs to be discovered in Victorian Britain. Uh, second. Second dinosaur to be discovered. Or second dinosaur to be named Megalosaurus was actually first. But, uh... Yeah. Yeah. Ice Cream Cone of Death. Funny Iguano Vlad the Impaler. There you go, Astronomy Show. Yeah. Yeah. Very soon afterwards came other similar fossilized creatures, and the Megalosaurus and Cetiosaurus quickly found themselves occupying pride of place in the museums. By now, people were Don't using touch the word that. dinosaur to describe a whole collection of prehistoric animals that have been found all over the world. Hmm. In 1877... Those are beautiful old models, by the way. They're very inaccurate. Look how they're all dragging their tails. They kind of look like droopy and lizardy and just... You know... But they're they're beautifully rendered. I I really like that. Just really classic, like mid-century style there. Of the world. In 1877, coal miners in the Belgian town of Bernissa were yeah. opening up a new coal seam when they came across the remains of 31 iguanodon skeletons, <laughs> 11 of them virtually complete. Very it's cool. It's believed that a whole group of them stumbled into a deep ravine by mistake, to remain there for over 100 million years. We don't actually think that they uh, they fell into a ravine. This is probably like there was some sort of a mass death assemblage, and then they all got washed down a river, it seems, 
and got snarled up on a riverbank or on a sandbar or something like that. Um, yeah, that idea that they fell into a... They all fell into a canyon. Like, no, what? But it was uh, in North America that dinosaur fever really took hold. Oh, yeah. Here are some of the numerous places they've been found. And... These should be shifted way over to the west. Shoot, most of these should be like Utah, Montana, and, uh, and Wyoming. This is like showing a bunch of stuff in like Colorado and Kansas and areas like that. That's not right. In Colorado, Wyoming, yeah. Utah, and Montana, uh -huh. and Canada. Fossil hunters in the early days even had to fight off the Red Indians to collect dinosaur relics. Oh, that part did not age well. And not just Indians, because at least two of the most dedicated of the American collectors, Edward Cope and Othniel Marsh, were so jealous of each other's discoveries that they actually fought gun battles between them over who yeah. could lay claim to the most bones. Luckily, kind of. there were the bone wars. To be found, yeah. In fact, more than enough for both of them. They could be found just lying in the desert, large bones waiting to be picked up. One non-dinosaur collector built a shack out of the bones. By the time Cope and Marsh... Yeah, so this is... Bone Cabin is a famous place in Wyoming. Let's see if we can look that up, actually. Yeah. There we go. Uh, the Fossil Cabin near Medicine Bow, Wyoming, built in 1932 as a roadside attraction. Uh, well, this is a little bit different, actually. That's the Fossil Cabin. But those are bits of dinosaur bones and probably some crocodile bones in there, too. Um, that the actual walls are built out of. But, yeah. Uh, the building that used to walk. <laughs> uh, this is not what we're talking about, though. Um, bone Cabin Quarry. We can probably get to it from there. Uh, approximately 55, 55 miles or 89 kilometers northwest of Laramie, Wyoming, near historic Como Bluff. Uh, there we go. Nearby was a sheep herder cabin built entirely out of fossil bones, hence the name Bone Cabin Quarry. Uh, yeah, so that is here in Wyoming. Well, there in Wyoming. Right, uh, right there. Anyway, Wyoming's a big old square. Not the most interesting state in terms of its outline, but very interesting state in terms of its dinosaur fossils. And I am slated to do some field work in Wyoming in June, from about early June to about early or mid-July. Going to be working in Wyoming with a, uh, with a crew there digging up some dinosaurs. Very excited about that. And I'm going to be live streaming it. As long as the equipment works like it's supposed to. Still still testing some stuff there. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, pretty close to Natural Trap Cavern. Yeah, not too far away from that, I think, Elwha Lynx. Or is that in... Is that in Wyoming or is that in South Dakota? Yeah. Uh... They should show the whole state, not just a random square. Oh, never mind. There you go, Gimplag. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, Bone Cabin Quarry. If you'd like to read more about that. Bow. There's the article. And uh, let us continue. Marsh ...had ceased their fighting and feuding. No fewer than 136 new kinds of dinosaurs have been discovered and named. There's a dinosaur national monument in the state of Utah. And actually, 136 new kinds of dinosaurs? That's... Probably a quarter of those are valid, if that. Like, some of the dinosaurs uh, described by Cope and Marsh... Well, shoot, if we go to the article for Bone Wars... Yeah, the Bone Wars on Wikipedia. I bet you they've probably got a list. The Bone Wars, also known as the Great Dinosaur Rush, was a period of intense and ruthlessly competitive fossil hunting and discovery during the Gilded, <coughs> Gilded Age of American history. Marked by a heated rivalry between Edward Drinker Cope 
and Othniel Charles Marsh. There's Cope with the thin mustache and Marsh with the big bushy beard. Edward Drinker Cope and way over there, Othniel Charles Marsh. Yeah. There is apparently actually going to be a like an HBO movie or series about the Bone Wars and it was going to star um what was it Steve Carell as Cope right here and then um shoot what's his name RIP uh the guy who played Tony Soprano in that show about the Sopranos what was it called what was his name he was going to play Marsh James Gandolfini, thank you, Claire Burr. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jude Law would also be a pretty good cope. You're right. Yeah. Um. Anyway, then James Gand Gandolfini died, and the project was shelved. But uh, man, I would love to see that. I would love to see that happen. It'd be uh, it'd be great. Um. Claire Burr says it should be Gary Oldman and Paul Giamatti. That would be excellent, Claire Burr. Holy cow, would that be stellar casting. I would love to see Paul Giamatti as Othniel Charles Marsh. Holy cow, the... Oh, man, that idea just makes me smile from ear to ear. That would be really, really funny. Yeah. Uh, you're really looking forward to that series? It's not happening now, Dr. Javasaurus. It's been indefinitely shelved. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, but yeah, what I was trying to find here is maybe a list of different dinosaurs discovered. Yeah. So Cope and Marsh's discoveries are among the most well-known of dinosaurs, encompassing species of Triceratops, Allosaurus, Diplodocus, Stegosaurus, Camarasaurus, Coelophysis. Um, who else? Uh, Apatosaurus. Um, oh boy. There's a bunch of other ones too. Yeah. Um, very cool. Yeah. Anyway. Uh,. Yeah, The Bone Wars is one of three stories retold in the New Jersey episode of the Comedy Central series Drunk History. If everybody promises to not be scandalized, maybe we'll watch that real quick, actually. Um, or you know what? No, we don't have time for that today. We'll do it another time. We'll do it another time. Um, but yeah, yeah. Another time tumor, boy. Uh, don't clutch those pearls. <laughs> Release the pearls, tumor boy. Unhand those pearls. And the Bone Wars were confined not just to the Americas, but to the western U.S., Dr. Javasaurus, yeah. Wyoming, Montana, Utah, Colorado, uh, and maybe to a certain extent Kansas and Nebraska and areas like that, too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, and Anomalous Symmetry says, when exactly did paleontologists end up agreeing about birds being dinosaurs? And what about the feathers thing? Ah, well, I have a command for that. There we go. So basically, the idea that birds evolved from dinosaurs has been around for a long time since like the uh, I don't know the 1880s something like that with Thomas Henry Huxley guy who worked with old Chucky e. D himself he worked with Charlie Darwin um, but it and there were some paleontologists who looked at certain dinosaurs and they went wow these things are remarkably bird like and so that had always been kind of an idea in the background like where did birds come from it had been a big mystery for a long time. Maybe they came from dinosaurs, you know? But then in the 1990s, bow, like a bolt from the blue, suddenly feathered dinosaurs start being found in China. 
and it became increasingly obvious that, hey, shoot, if dinosaurs have feathers, and some dinosaurs are extraordinarily bird-like, and some early birds are extraordinarily dinosaur-like, holy cow, birds evolved from dinosaurs. Nowadays, ask any paleontologist, any evolutionary biologist, any bird scientist, any ornithologist, they'll tell you the same thing. That's the general consensus nowadays. Um, so I guess right around the year 2000, maybe, is when that sea change really happened. When these feathered dinosaurs started coming out of China, initially some paleontologists were a little doubtful. They're like, well, are those really dinosaurs or are they just weird-looking birds? And then the more, more and more and more species of feathered dinosaurs started to come out, the more it became increasingly difficult to argue that there's anything else going on except birds evolving into dinosaurs. Does that make sense? So it was really around the the earliest 2000s, I guess, that just about every paleontologist and subsequently every ornithologist and evolutionary biologist got on board with the idea. So yeah. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Anomalous Symmetry says, I was actually thinking of beginning of streaming here, but I'm not sure what the shape, the content could take. So I look forward to that. Cool. Anomalous Symmetry. Well, I've been streaming here since, since, uh, May of 2020. And, uh, we've got a wonderful community here. People really interested to hear about science. And, uh, it's been pretty great. This is my full-time job nowadays, if you can believe that. Believe it or not, I make more money doing this. Even though I don't make very much, this, you know, I'm able to make, you know, just enough to survive on, pay my bills, and, you know, save a little bit of money for a rainy day. This is still more money than I've ever made working for a museum as a paleontologist, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, thanks for the timeline. You bet. Anomalous symmetry, yeah. Yeah, let me know if you've got any other questions. We need more people here doing science on Twitch. You know? So, yeah. Do you have a background in science? Symmetry? Let me know. Um, yeah. Because we absolutely need that. Believe me. <laughs> and physics. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Well, shoot. If you've got the right personality, and if you enjoy answering people's questions, and, you know, maybe... If you've got some penchant for a little bit of a little bit of showmanship to keep things interesting, then yeah, you could definitely be successful here. So yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, it's great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Let's get back to our video here, shall we? Yeah. Dinosaurs have been discovered and named. There's a dinosaur national monument in the state of Utah with yeah. a special walkway where visitors can see dinosaur bones dinosaurs trapped inside. The absolute prerequisite to the evolution of large mammals and to our own existence for that matter. It's true. Grandview Slims, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Cliff face. And the town yeah. nearby, just a mile or two across the Colorado border, also has a new name. Dinosaur. With street signs straight from our dinosaur dozens. Yep. I actually have photos of these. Uh, <laughs> I passed through Dinosaur Colorado uh, in summer of 2021 with Lordy. And uh, and also, this past summer, summer of 2022, I passed through Dinosaur Colorado. And I did some live streams uh, in this area. One of them from Dinosaur National Monument outside of Jensen, Utah. So, yeah. Yeah before doing some field work a little bit further south in eastern Utah. Dinosaur, with street signs straight from our dinosaur dozens. Yeah. Dinosaur remains. I wonder if I can find those real quick, actually. I bet you I can find some photos. Let's see. They might be videos, too. I don't know. Um, This would be... July of 2021. There we go. There's Dinosaur National Monument. There's me here at the uh, Dinosaur National Monument 
uh, dinosaur quarry there. Um, yeah, here's me with the Stegosaurus out front. Yeah. But I guess I actually went through here twice, because I went through once by myself and then once with Lordy. We were coming back. And, uh... Let's see... Yeah, welcome to Dinosaur, Colorado, gateway to Dinosaur National Monument. Come on. Yeah, I guess I don't actually have the photos of the street signs, though. Lordy must have those. But yeah. Uh, I guess she was... I was driving and she was taking the pictures. But, uh... Yeah, anywho. That trip was a lot of fun. Uh, anywho, yeah. And Symmetry says, Biology is a lot easier to show than physics, but there's things one can do with simulations, I think. I guess so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and welcome back, Iron Man. Good to have you. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. And, uh... And there you go, yeah. Lita and Balint are probably having their baby right now, actually, Golganek, in the hospital. Um, but yeah, yeah. Science Stream's definitely a channel to check out. Check out Constababble, Freckled Science, Diatom's Attack. Um, we've got some excellent science communication streamers here on Twitch, for certain. Anyway, back to our video. ...have been found in almost every part of the world. And we may be sure Rocket there Sage, are still there you many go, yeah. more waiting to yeah. be discovered. And although they vary tremendously in shape, size, and weight, all the dinosaurs have one thing in common. Their names were difficult to spell? No, it was all to do with the way they walked. <laughs> because all dinosaurs walked with erect leg movements. In other words, they were reptiles that were able to stand upright. Like birds Unlike do. some reptiles I could name. Here, here, here. It's not my fault that my legs come out at the side. I can't help being a sprawler. Of course it's not your fault, Bill. <laughs> I'm sure you're perfectly at home swimming along in a swamp. Look, see? We crocs can stand up when we're running. That's right, but you can't yeah. stand up properly, not like a dinosaur. Well, that's what my song was all about, wasn't it? If I uh, had yes, to uh, be uh, I shouldn't worry about it too much, you know, Dill. <laughs> After all, if you were a dinosaur, you'd be extinct by now. I know that. But remember that I am... Well, not... Back in the 1980s, we didn't realize that birds were dinosaurs yet, so that's how they could get away with saying that. But yeah. I'm related yeah. to the dinosaurs. After all, I was born from an egg. You're right, Dill. It's now known that the dinosaurs were hatched from eggs in specially prepared nesting sites that were looked after by their parents. Quite recently, a whole nesting site of hadrosaurs has been found in America, and big nests of. Those are oh boy. These, so these are actors, and that's those are props. Uh, they look more like sauropod eggs, honestly. But uh, those are not real dinosaurs. Perfect eggs found in Mongolia in Asia. Yes, and we will be talking about this extensively tomorrow. Because tomorrow, January 26th, happens to be the birthday of Roy Chapman Andrews right here. Uh, famed early 20th century explorer and adventurer, fossil collector, naturalist, zoologist, Roy Chapman Andrews. Roy Chapman Andrews helped organize the Central Asiatic Expeditions into Mongolia. He was the expedition leader. The expeditions were actually his idea. Um, so yeah, the whole reason that we now look at Mongolia as one of the the countries with the, the richest dinosaur fossil heritages, well, that was first kind of discovered by Roy Chapman Andrews. Um, yeah... Roy Chapman Andrews, who... Oh, here we go. Roy Chapman Andrews, right here. Uh, who has often been cited as... part of the inspiration for the character of Indiana Jones. We'll be talking about that tomorrow. And we'll be talking extensively about your dinosaur deep dive, Claire Burr, City Patty, formerly known as Overaptor. Uh, Overaptor Osmolske. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, 
Yeah. Uh, and I've never been to Mongolia. I'd love to go someday, but I haven't been yet. Iron Man, no. No. Uh, but anyway, we'll be talking all about Roy Chapman Andrews tomorrow. Uh, for a special like, birthday celebration stream for him. Talking about the Central Asiatic Expeditions, Mongolian dinosaurs, all that good stuff. So, yeah. It's funny to think that a great big dinosaur like a Diplodocus could have come out of such a tiny egg. That's right, Dill. But the eggs couldn't have been much bigger, because a bigger egg would need a much tougher shell. Yeah. And if the shell becomes too tough and thick, the baby dinosaur inside couldn't peck its way out. A better croc could. Of course, Dill. <laughs> Today we believe that... <laughs> That's funnier than it had any right to be. Um, <laughs> I feel dumb laughing at that, but yeah. Yeah. Tougher shell. And if the shell becomes too tough and thick, the baby dinosaur inside couldn't peck its way out. A better croc could. Of course, Dill. Today we believe that half a dozen to a dozen was about as many eggs as most dinosaurs would lay at any one time. Here is a typical clutch. A completely fossilized protoceratops nest. Ooh. Spoiler alert. But, uh, those aren't actually protoceratops eggs. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Yeah. Just imagine half a dozen little dinosaurs all hollering for attention. <laughs> and dinosaurs could shout, I can tell you. Mm, wouldn't have been much fun keeping one as a pet, would Infin it? Infinity <laughs> Luna, how you doing? Welcome, welcome. <laughs> not Tyrannosaurus, I think. But if he escaped mm, into the streets of London, dreadful model. he wouldn't have been much of a pet. Among the total of over 800 dinosaurs, Tyrannosaurus was probably the most frightening and certainly one of the tallest animals ever to walk on the Earth. What? Tyrannosaurus was nowhere close to one of the tallest animals to ever walk the Earth. That's ridiculous. What? It's one of the, maybe one of the tallest carnivorous animals, but animals overall, nowhere close to even like medium-sized sauropods. You know? Shoot. Um, anyway, this footage that you see right here is from 1925's film, 1925's stop motion animation film, The Lost World, which we will be watching maybe for our generator fundraiser live stream. Um, but yeah, that'll be fun. Here's one of his relatives fighting Triceratops in the 1925 film, The Lost World. Yeah. The only good thing about him is the fact that this sort of film got it wrong. Because he could only walk quite slowly, and so he wasn't much of a hunter at all, in fact. Uh, no, that's the funny thing, is that the film actually got it right. It was ahead of its time in that regard. They were wrong about dinosaurs in the 1980s. Tyrannosaurus probably would have been a fairly fast-moving animal, especially when it was younger. Gotta take ontogeny into consideration here. But yeah, yeah. He spent most of his days feeding off the kills made by others. Unlike this scene, where a Tyrannosaurus is shown eating a deer, which wasn't even around then. That's not a Tyrannosaurus. This is from... That's from, um... Oh, goodness. The 1977 film? When dinosaurs roamed the Earth? With Victoria Vetri, I think? Right? Anyway, that's a made-up dinosaur right there. Yeah. Do you know what dinosaurs did all day? Well, my great 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 grandfather remembers his great 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 grandmother telling him what dinosaurs did. They just sort of plodded around going nowhere or just sat still for long periods of time. Very funny gimp yeah. We crocs do in swamps or on rocks. Sounds rather boring. Not at all. It refreshes the brain, which many of the dinosaurs hadn't got much of. I know. Oh please. Like Diplodocus and that practically brainless clot Stegosaurus. They all had very small. That's not Stegosaurus. Who's brainless now? That's supposed to be Polycanthus right there. Brains. Not all. Not Some even a good Polycanthus. Some of the dinosaurs had quite well-developed brains when compared with the weight of their bodies. They were quite intelligent. In fact, some of them were almost as bright as you modern crocodiles, Dill. Oh, thank oh. you. What's some more? of them were considerably more, probably considerably more intelligent than crocodiles. You know, much more bird-like. Very good eyes for night hunting, as well as fierce teeth and claws. So they weren't all pea brains like the plodders and the armored dinosaurs? Quite the opposite. There were the hunters and killers. They had the skills to chase and kill almost anything that moved. From reptiles and dinosaurs to some of the ancestors of mammals that human beings are descended from. Yep. I think 
this means the next dinosaur dozen's coming up. Oh, uh, the killer dinosaurs. Dinosaur <laughs> dozen. The killers. Theropod dinosaurs. Two-legged, primarily meat-eating dinosaurs. Now here uh. they are once again. Those dinosaur names. Try to say them out loud and then say them again. Diplodocus, Volcanodon, and Plateosaurus, Iguanodon, Deinonychus, and Tyrannosaurus, Triceratops, Ilophysis, and Hypsilophodon, with Taurosaurus, Stegosaurus. That's about enough of them. <laughs> Comsognathus. Uh. Procomsognathus. Uh, it bugs me how all the dinosaurs are like, you know, they're all just kind of mud colored. It's like they're either brown or they're green, or they're yellowish brown, or they're greenish yellow, or they're brownish green. Like, oh goodness, it it really bugs me in this. Coelophysis. Coelophysis. Coelurus. Coelurus. Deinonychus. Yeah. Dromiseomimus. Dromiseomimus. Gallimimus. Gallimimus. Megalosaurus. Dilophosaurus. Yep. Allosaurus. Spinosaurus. <laughs> Tyrannosaurus. Uh, they quite give me the shivers, even after 65 million years. But at least we've something to be grateful to them for. What's that? Leaving so many fossils around for us to find. Yeah, after lots of other things, all too. All the dinosaurs yeah. we know today were walking around on the Earth at one time. Tradoon. And when they were killed or died of old age or an accident, like those iguanodons in Belgium, they left us all kinds of valuable clues to the ways in which they lived. How did it happen? How considerate As of them, seen, you know? So many of the dinosaurs lived in swamp and marsh country. And when they died, their bodies would slowly sink down to the bottom of the swamp. Then, as the flesh and muscle all rotted away to nothing, the layers of mud and silt surrounding it gradually dried out to turn into soft layers of stone. Yep. Just like the chicken bone that we buried in plaster mix. Was it a great big dog? Was it a fierce old giant? Now how will we ever know? No, 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 no. Perhaps an elephant. No, that can't be right. Maybe a fiery dragon that set things alight. Well, we've racked our brains and we still don't know. Perhaps we should have left things alone. Oh, what is the answer? A prehistoric monster. Well, what do we make of these bones? Okay. Eventually, after Reprise of that song. Of years, the combined pressure of the earth and rock on top slowly began to change the skeleton of the fallen dinosaur into a kind of stone, generally keeping its dinosaur shape. That's how the fossil iguanodon of Dr. Mantell met his fate, trapped for millions of years in a swamp floor that turned to stone and was finally found in the layers of sandstone in the quarry. That's right, Dill. <laughs> Just like this seal yeah. officers. And that's not all. That looks like it's actually supposed to be iguanodon right there. I don't know why they're calling it seal of Isis. But yeah, uh, any plans for a dinosauroid command? Not right now, Abogado, no. Welcome back, by the way. It's good to see you. Uh, I don't know. The whole dinosauroid thing, I... <sighs> kind of makes me scoff. So I don't like to bring too much attention to it. Now, obviously, the bones that fell to the bottom of the swamp first will be found far lower down in the stone layers than the bones of the dinosaurs that died later. Yep. And those dinosaurs that lived and died during the final period of dinosaur life on Earth, the Cretaceous period, will be found on top of all of them. Yep. Right at the bottom, my old ancestor, the fierce old Thecodontian. And as we go back up through the layers, all the various dinosaur groups gradually come to light. Just as the paleontologists yep. discovered them. The lowest layer, the Triassic. Middle to late... You know, as, as corny as some of these things are, I really appreciate the creativity here. Like... I've never really seen an elevator used like this as, you know, a means of illustrating, like, moving up through time and uh, and seeing these different critters. Like, I, you got to appreciate the creativity there. Them. The lowest layer, the Triassic. Middle to late Triassic. Celophysis. Procomsognathus. Ornithosuchus. Platyosaurus. And Thecodontosaurus. Jurassic! Mind the gates, please. Thank you. Comsognathus. Megalosaurus. Allosaurus. Oh, hello. Mamankiosaurus. Diplodocus. Brachiosaurus. Stegosaurus. And Supersaurus. Cretaceous. Deinonychus. Hype. Silophodon. Iguanodon. Shantungosaurus. Stegosaurus. Citicosaurus. Protoceratops, Microceratops, Tri... Oh, Ceratops. 
Achoo! Oh, Anki, Losaurus. Oh, t t t t t Tyrannosaurus and Strosiosaurus. Oh, what a lot of saurus. Hmm. The Cretaceous was the last part that of the went on a little longer than it could have. Mesozoic age, and there were then more different dinosaurs around than ever before. Mind you, by the time we get to the next. Uh, Infinity Luna says, I hope to be a paleontologist someday. That's pretty amazing. Well, welcome, welcome, Infinity Luna. Shoot, you were in the right place. You know, I've been a dinosaur paleontologist for a number of years now. I go out and dig up dinosaurs for various museums. I study dinosaurs. I publish on them. If you've got any questions or anything like that, then shoot, you know who to ask. It's good to have you here. We've got several aspiring paleontologists here in chat, and uh, it's a great place to hang out. And yeah, I I really think that a one of the most important things about developing a a passion in an area and thinking about a career in that area is to hang out with people who are in that same field. So if you don't have anybody who lives near you who's in paleontology, well. Hopefully this can be some kind of a, a surrogate here, this community, you know? Um, hopefully you can get some of that here on Twitch, on this channel. So yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, welcome Galara Dragon, good to have you here. And that crocodile is a show-off, you're right, Raven. <laughs> and Lenina, you are not old, my goodness. I appreciate you, Lenina. Thank you for being... Such a remarkable supporter of this community. And we've got more crinkling sounds coming from the 3D printer. Let me go check on that. Really spectacular. Spared no expense. Miss Nine gifted a tier one sub to Infinity Luna 22. They have given 31 gift subs in the channel. There we go. Much better. Thank you, Bliss9, for gifting Infinity Luna. Thank you, thank you. Really appreciate that. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for the hydrates, Safarex and Claire Burr. Appreciate that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, let's continue with our video here. Shoot, we're like... Th Two thirds of the way through already. It's pretty decent. Floor, the tertiary yeah. age, you'll notice quite a few changes. Tertiary and Cainozoic. Mammals. Cenozoic. Crocodiles, saber toothed tigers, and mammoths. No dinosaurs? Sorry, Dill, not one. Oh. Except for and birds. By the time we reach our own age, the Quaternary, human beings have arrived, and all that remains of the world of dinosaurs are the huge collections of bones and fossilized skeletons that have been found yep. all over the world in the rocks of that period. Alamosaurus. All right, Dark Nobody Tarkanus. Nobody knows for sure just how or why the dinosaurs all died out. Yeah. Well, I've heard one or two theories. This dinosaur right, then, fellow was... Uh, but before you tell us all your theories about how the dinosaurs died away, let's see our fourth dinosaur dozen. Mm. These are the Ceratopsian dinosaurs, some of the very last dinosaurs on Earth. Now here they are once again, those dinosaur names. Try to no. say them out loud and then say them again. Diplodocus, Volcanodon, and Plantiosaurus, Iguanodon, Dinonyx. Do they just call them Ceratopsians? That's bizarre. And Hypsilophodon with Taurosaurus, Stegosaurus. That's about enough of them. My I mean, ooh, that's a terrible microceratops. Yowza. I don't know if microceratops is even considered a ceratopsian anymore. Um, but anyway, yeah, they just call them Ceratopsians here, which is the paleontological name. That's what paleontologists call them. If you wanted to simplify it, you could just call them horned dinosaurs, you know, for the layman, horned dinosaurs. Surprised they didn't say that. Microceratops. Cytogosaurus. Protoceratops. We'll be talking all about protoceratops tomorrow. When we talk about the Central Asiatic expeditions and Roy Chapman Andrews and all that. Chasmosaurus. Mm. A rhinoceratops. Anchiceratops. Pentaceratops. Styracosaurus. Pachyrhinosaurus. Ooh. Monoclonius. <laughs> Torosaurus. Triceratops. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, Ceratopsians. Here. In the chat. And what is this? Another musical number? Yeah, pretty lousy Ceratopsians there, to be honest. Nobody really seems to know. Oh, boy. Going. Uh, Crystal Alpaca. Thank you for the four months of support. Really appreciate that, Crystal. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> An appropriately derpy dinosaur for this moment. Appreciate you, Crystal Alpaca. Thank you for keeping me online for the past four months. Uh, Just and Safarix, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Here. Were their eggs all eaten by creatures great and small? Did a meteor fall from the sky? Is that what killed them? Is that what killed them all? Yep, pretty much. Equally likely scenarios. <laughs> that did look like a taco with legs. You're right, Lilithobo, yeah. Hey, Lethgar, how you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Well, you've certainly given us plenty to think about, Dill. Yes. I'm not too sure about the men from Mars or the Noah's Ark. I think the meteor theory the most likely, yeah. though it didn't kill us crocs. At any rate, the dinosaurs yeah. disappeared entirely at around the end of the Cretaceous period and were never seen again. But there are still plenty of dinosaur near relatives around today. Apart from you and your crocodile chums, I suppose. Well, that's right. And it's not just crocodiles, you know. All kinds of animals are related to the original Thecodontium. You've only yeah. got to remember Dr. Mantell's Iguanodon, the lizards. Dinosaur means terrible lizard. That's right. Now just take a lizards look at this. are not very close to Maybe dinosaurs. Cold blooded, but there's dinosaur blood in its veins somewhere. And snake? Nah, really. Snakes are also modified lizards. Snakes and monitor lizards are pretty closely related. They're much more closely related to each other. A snake is much closer to a Komodo dragon than either of them is to a dinosaur. Still? Oh, yes. Despite yeah. their strange way of getting around, and there you go, they symmetry. Too are descended from the same group of <laughs> reptilian ancestors as the dinosaurs, just the same as turtles and tortoises. Is that the full extent of your dinosaur relatives, then, Dill? Well, perhaps, but not quite. No. Just listen to this. Ah, dinosaurs! But that's a cockatoo, Dill. Exactly, and there's an amazing connection between birds and dinosaurs. Yeah. Um, beak. So back in the 1970s and early 1980s. This was, this idea was floating around, but it wasn't like, there wasn't a strong consensus about it yet that birds had evolved from dinosaurs. So let's see what they say back, back here. Exactly. And there's an amazing connection between birds and dinosaurs. Oh. Beak, eggs, claws, erect leg stands. Mm -hmm. That's right. And although some of the resemblances are only coincidental. No, turns out none of those coincid, none of those are coincidental. All of them are homologous. Those are all different characteristics that birds inherited from their dinosaur ancestors. Um, yeah, shoot. Somebody type in exclamation mark turkey 
in chat. And I will show you. Uh, that blows your mind, the bird thing? Well, shoot, this is really going to blow your mind, Symmetry. Take a look. Uh, this is an infographic that I put together. Oh, come on. There we go. An image in new tab. I put this together for uh, for Thanksgiving in 2021. I've been using it ever since. Your turkey, Thanksgiving turkey, Christmas turkey, Boxing Day budgie, your uh, Remembrance Day ostrich, whatever. If you eat, if you're the sort of person who eats birds, I'm not really much of a bird eater myself, but many people are. The next time you're uh, you're taking a look, or you're eating a bird like that, look at its bones. So this is the skeleton of a turkey, Meliagris gallopavo, next to that of a velociraptor. And I bet you you can't tell which one is which, right? Kidding, of course you can. But there are a huge number of similarities between them. And they're not just similarities, they're what we call homologous structures. So both of these animals evolved from the same ancestor, like fairly recent, like... They share a recent common ancestor, is what we would say. So most of the features that make birds unique among modern animals, everything from their S-shaped neck to their three-fingered hand, their uh, three-toed feet uh, with, like, one little toe on the side, the hallux, their, uh, their keeled sternum, their wishbone, their hollow bones in general, their backwards-pointing pubis, their, uh, their feathers, even. Each one of these things are originally from their dinosaur ancestors. Each one of those is a dinosaur hand-me-down. Except for, maybe the, maybe the keeled sternum isn't, actually. I didn't put that one on here. But anyway, you can download that. You can print it. You can share it with your friends and family. I, uh, I think I laminated a copy for myself, didn't I? Where did I put that? I got myself a laminator recently, and I have been super excited about that. Yeah, here it is. So, when I'm in the field, uh, I've got a laminated copy. So, rain or shine, or snow, sleet, or hail, you know, got a laminated copy that I can show to the camera and, uh, and talk about this. Yeah, and on the back, Archosaur phylogeny, like we looked at earlier. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, it also makes a wonderful placemat. <laughs> So that's free. You can download that yourself and print it, share it to your heart's content. Uh, the Lenina here in our community, faithful and highly effective moderator, the Lenina, she actually, she and uh, and Blue Front actually printed a bunch of these and uh, dropped them off at the grocery store in the frozen turkey section before Thanksgiving, which I thought was, uh, was pretty awesome. So, uh, yeah, pretty neat, Lenina. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but yeah, there you go. Anyway, the uh, the uniqueness of bird skeletons, not actually unique. Most of those features are inherited from their dinosaur ancestors. Velociraptor itself. Uh, our modern picture of Velociraptor is like this. If you were to see this animal in life, it would basically look like a big, weird, scary bird. There we go. Uh, much like this right here. Yeah. Here. Uh, roop. Tell me how the volume is on that. There's Velociraptor. Yeah. It's loud? Shoot, okay. 
I guess that's a good sign. How's that? Hey, bot leak. How you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Oh, I can see why. Okay. Yeah. Pretty neat animal. So this is our modern picture of Velociraptor. We've known they looked like this since... Yeah, about the mid-2000s. So yeah, Jurassic World lied to you. Velociraptor didn't look like that. It looked like this. And we've known this for almost 20 years at this point. Yeah. Put a bird on it. There you go, little Tobo. Yeah. Yeah, Prehistoric Planet is amazing, Symmetry. I'm so glad you've had a chance to watch it. Really, really excellent. Hmm. Uh... Anyway, if you would like to see the rest of this and figure out if those Velociraptors do end up, if those Velociraptors do end up having a pterosaur meal, you'll have to watch Prehistoric Planet, which you can do for free using that link there. Um, yeah, through Apple Plus TV or whatever that's called. It's well worth it, I promise you. It's really, really good. Uh, so anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, and Iron Man says dinosaurs were living in social groups. I was wondering if there was a leader of the group or leaders in these social groups. Elusive deer with an elusive duck there. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to paleontologizing. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. The actual structure of dinosaur groups, we can't really be sure of yet, Iron Man. That's a good question, but... I guess in a situation like that, what we would do is uh, we would consult the old EPB, this conceptual framework that we have for uh, trying to figure out things for dinosaurs, which maybe we haven't been able to figure out from the fossil record yet. Stuff like social structure is really hard to decipher from the fossil record. So we look at their modern relatives, crocodiles, kind of like cousins to the dinosaurs. And birds, who themselves are living dinosaurs. What does bird social structure look like? Do they have a, a leader in their groups? Do crocodiles have leaders for their groups? Crocodiles aren't super social. But, uh, yeah. Um, it's a good question. We don't, we don't really know yet. Yeah. Uh, a new bet, Travel. Thank you for being here, Travel. I appreciate you. Yeah. Is there a lead bird in a flock of birds? Not usually, Galara Dragon. I don't think so. But I'm not sure. How varied are birds in their social structures? Very, highly varied, I think, symmetry. That's something that varies a lot across all of, uh, of Aves. Yeah. Oh, very funny, Lilithobo. <laughs> uh. Nedbog. <laughs> Nedbog, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Um, do parrots have leaders? I don't know. I really don't know. It's a good question. Anyway, yeah, Fiction let's continue. Birds and dinosaurs. Oh. Beak, eggs, claws, erect leg stands. That's right. And all those yeah. some of the feathers too. Hollow bones. No one really. Ankle structure. The descended from the parrot bill dinosaur. Well, no, that's definitely true. I mean, Cetacosaurus did not give rise to parrots. Parrots, like all birds, are descended from theropod dinosaurs, from a totally different group of dinosaurs. Shoot, I'll show you a phylogeny. Um, and Nedbog, what are we paleontologizing for? Because that's what we do here on this channel. What do you mean? Take paleontology and make it a now a verb. Take that uh, that noun, and we verbify it. We're doing fossil science here, paleontologizing. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the channel. It's good to have you here. Now, uh, let me pull that up. Um, yeah, here we go. Pull up a dinosaur phylogeny here. Uh, that'll do nicely, I think. So this is an evolutionary family tree of dinosaurs. And you see birds are over here. They're descended from theropod dinosaurs, the two-legged meat-eating dinosaurs. Like uh, the dromaeosaurs and troodontids. Uh, they're very close. They also had feathers. The further out you go, the more unsure we are that these animals had feathers. Like spinosaurs, we don't know if they had feathers. Abelisaurs, I don't know if they had feathers. Herrerasaurus, who knows. Um... Although some of these guys, like some heterodontosaurs do seem to have had feathers, and some ornithopods too. So yeah, yeah. Anywho, you can type in exclamation mark feathers for uh, for more information about that. But, uh... Yeah, anyway. Uh... Oh, apologize. Oh, okay, I get it, Nedbog. I didn't realize you were making a joke. <laughs> I thought maybe there was a language miscommunication there. Like a language barrier. But no, you're making an apologizing joke. I get it now. Okay. I don't think of it that way. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Lenina, quick on the draw there, Lenina. Yes, absolutely. The Mokilimbembe. Yeah. Uh, don't get me started on that. <laughs> but yeah. Um... But shoot, before I forget, we've got a dinosaur deep dive here from Dark Tarkanus. Why don't we cover that real quick? Let's cover Alamosaurus. Remember the Alamosaurus. Let's do that. Dinosaur deep dive right now for Alamosaurus. There's a beautiful Alamosaurus reconstruction there. Um, a My old crew chief, Denver Fowler, actually published a paper... On Alamosaurus. Uh, or did he actually publish it? Maybe he was just presenting on it at SVP. I forget. But Alamosaurus is actually in the running for largest dinosaur. Argentina has some other remarkable dinosaurs that very well might be larger. Like Argentinosaurus, Patagotitan, critters like that. But... Alamosaurus is a close relative. It's another titanosaur. And it was truly gargantuan. It's only known from very fragmentary material. We don't actually know very much about it. Here is like a composite skeleton. Uh, and take this with a grain of salt because it is from DeviantArt. There we go. Alamosaurus sanwanensis. The parts in white are the parts that we actually have. And there should be another cervical vertebra there, too. Um, anyway, like I said, take this with a grain of salt. But uh, Alamosaurus, really big dinosaur. Uh, there is a skeletal mount of Alamosaurus alongside a T-Rex. At this museum in Texas, I believe. Hey, can I just get a single ah, living dinosaur? Uh, Julio Sebas, thank you for the follow. Bienvenidos, Julio. Y gracias por seguirme. Great to have you here. Yeah, so Alamosaurus is one of the very last of the dinosaurs. It's a sauropod that actually lived at the very end of the Cretaceous period. So there it is next to T Rex there. That looks like the Wonko Rex next to it, actually. Beautiful. I didn't know how they had a Wonka Rex at the Perot Museum. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, very nice. Yeah. So, here's three different Alamosaurus specimens here. There you go. Showing their estimated sizes. This is one of the very largest of the dinosaurs. And one of the very last of the dinosaurs. We don't quite know how big it could get, nor exactly what its skeleton would have looked like. Um, there's the holotype scapula and paratype ischium there. That's a shoulder blade there on the left. 
And then uh, the ischium, these are big hip bones from the back of the hips underneath on the right. Yeah. Uh, I've been discovered throughout the southwest U.S. Holotype was discovered in June 1921 by Charles Whitney Gilmore, uh, John Bernard Reeside, and Charles Azalea Sternberg uh, in New Mexico. Um, yep, there's that Perot Museum mount again. Really, really big dinosaur. Really impressive. But we don't really know that much about it right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they're saying the latest are from just below the KPG boundary in the Black Peaks Formation. So these dinosaurs would have lived right up until that big asteroid hit 66 million years ago. So here's a tip. Um, anytime you see a depiction of, uh, here, let's see. Of a sauropod dinosaur with the big KPG asteroid coming down. That's supposed to be Alamosaurus right there. Um, yeah. There we go. So here, in uh, the Dinosauria series, we have Alamosaurus there doing its thing. Yeah. Very cool. Uh oh. Yeah, anyway, Alamosaurus. Um, Alamosaurus gets a lot of attention, I think. A lot more attention than other dinosaurs that are equally poorly known because it is from the very end of the Cretaceous. So if you want to show a sauropod next to that asteroid, you know, about to buy the farm along with the rest of its dinosaur comrades, except for birds, then you show Alamosaurus. Also, if you want to show T-Rex taking on a sauropod dinosaur, you show it with Alamosaurus. Um, so yeah. Yeah, here's a link to this video if you'd like to see it. Uh, by David Armsby. Really, really excellent. Beautiful animation there, Bot Leak. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. And the Alamo is the cottonwood tree. Is that right? Galara Dragon. I didn't know that. Is it Spanish for cottonwood? Um, let's see... Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah, a, g a tree of the genus Populus, especially Aspen. Uh, interesting. Uh, borrowed from Spanish Alamo, or cottonwood tree. There we go. Uh, thank you for teaching me something there. I, uh, I appreciate that, Galara Dragon. Very nice. Yeah. And, uh, Infinity Luna, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Um... And Anomalous Symmetry says, My country's National Museum of Natural History was totally destroyed in a fire. Oh, in, uh, in Brazil? Symmetry? Oh, no, India. Oh, shoot. There have been a couple of bad fires in, uh, in natural history museums in recent years. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, Orchid Twilight says, can't even imagine how many unknown bird species were wiped out of existence from the asteroid. Yeah, it's probably more than half of all bird species went extinct when the asteroid hit. When we say that birds survived the KPG impact, they survived the end Cretaceous extinction event, that's only a handful of species. Like, it may have been that most bird species were wiped out, gone forever. 
But yeah. Yeah. And I agree, we must preserve history. True. Uh, Lepaku, yes indeed. Yeah. Anyway, let's, uh, let's get back to our video here, shall we? And yeah, about 50% at least of mammal species also got wiped out so far, X, yeah. Mind you, there are still a lot of experts yeah. who believe that birds could be the largest surviving branch of the dinosaur dynasty. And True! Because Archaeopteryx here... Ha well, I'm surprised that, uh, that they actually say this back in 1982. Because, yeah, nowadays that's... Ask any paleontologist and they'll tell you birds are living dinosaurs. ...could be the yeah. larat bill dinosaur... Mind you, there are still a lot of experts who believe that birds could be the largest surviving branch of the dinosaur dynasty. The anyway, only surviving branch. Because Archaeopteryx yeah. had feathers, <laughs> wings, and a beak, it has been rightly called the first bird. But the Archaeopteryx should be compared with this little chap, the Coelurosaur. And when this was done, they found at least 21 common factors of shape and structure, including so many more nowadays. So many more. Exactly the size of a chicken. So birds really could be related to dinosaurs. It's more than a theory. It's a distinct possibility. But what about the other flying reptiles, like the pteranodons? Aren't they flying dinosaurs? Far no, from. they're not. The pteranodons were never yeah. real dinosaurs. They didn't have the legs for it. No, they were strictly pterosaurs. Flying yep. reptiles, not dinosaurs. Lots of people do get it wrong thinking... So they're basically cousins to the dinosaurs. I'm glad that they get this right. It's good stuff. Yeah. And Ilona was born... Holy cow, Ali J. Holy moly. That... Uh, really, really exciting. Balint and Lita just had their baby. Balint shared a photo on Discord. Thank you for that link, Claire Burr. <laughs> I, I assume this is not the photo. Um, there's Balint. Um, yeah, shoot. Does anybody have a photo, uh, a link to the photo? Wrong link, says Claire Burr. <laughs> uh, somebody give me a link here. Yeah. Um. Very, very nice. Wow. Well, congratulations to Blint and Lita, new parents. Holy cow. And, uh. There she is. Holy moly. Brand new baby. Uh, 100% right there. Yep. 100% <laughs> cute. My weight is 7 pounds, 10 ounces. Very nice. Mode manual. Not baby mode. Manual mode. Um. Oh my goodness. I don't know why I'm making jokes. She's adorable. And, uh, congratulations to Belint and Lita. Amazing. Huge congrats. Uh, her name is Ilona. And uh, I'm sure she'll be making an appearance on stream before too long. She has Balint's cheeks? She does. You're right, Jody Fitch. <laughs> well, let's hope that she has both of her parents' enthusiasm for, for science and learning and... Uh, I'm really looking forward to meeting her on stream. Yeah. Uh, very cool. Oh, and very cool, Anina. Same exact weight? Very nice. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, she looks like her father? As she should. It's more for the Yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing. Born at 17.17 p.m., Eastern time, Balint's time, Alec J. Very nice. Seventeen seventeen. Wow. On January twenty fifth, twenty twenty three. My goodness. Well, I don't even know what to say, except congratulations and uh, yeah, I had to find some. Dinosaur onesies or something like that that I can send to uh, to Belint and Lita. Yeah, I'm sure she'll have plenty of science merch to wear already. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. 
Awesome. Welcome to the world, maybe Ilona. Yeah. Well, let's let's continue with our video here. We're falling a little bit behind. I want to be able to finish this up. Let's uh, let's continue here, shall we? That the pterosaurs were dinosaurs. Yes, and just look at all the other animals that people sometimes mistake for dinosaurs too. Oh no. Yeah. Oh. oh boy. You know the old Loch Ness monster and Fiesta Dragons too have all been called dinosaurs, but that isn't true. We crocodiles may well have the same ancestry. But he's no dinosaur. Oh no, I'm very much me. No, he's no dinosaur. Yeah. I'm very much me. Take it away, boys! <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, I'll see you soon, Symmetry. Thanks for being here. Except for birds. Yeah. Oh, you may think we're dinosaurs, oh, but we're not. Well, we may have some features that the dinosaurs got. We pretty the faces, we have much nicer teeth. And now we're certainly not dinosaurs underneath. And now we're certainly yeah. not dinosaurs underneath. The product line. Yeah. Well, so Astronomy much show? things that definitely we'll aren't dinosaurs. Yeah. Who knows what other weird monsters are waiting to be discovered? Maybe some are still around today. Mm. Well, there have been some fairly amazing discoveries concerning prehistoric animals and plants that people had always assumed to be extinct for millions of years. So, perhaps there could still be the odd dinosaur waiting to be discovered. Perhaps even the famous monster at the bottom of Loch Ness. Yes, the Loch Ness monster has certainly kept people baffled for a long time. He must have been pretty well protected to have lasted for the past 65 million years, though. Talk yeah, no. My last dinosaur dozen were really well protected. Oh, watch out. Here come the armored dinosaurs. Thyria forens, yeah. Dinosaur dozen, the armored ones. Put that British U in there, armored dinosaurs. Now here they are, the final time those dinosaur names. Try to say them out loud and then say them again. Anyway. Diplodocus, Vulcanodon, uh, Plantiosaurus, Iguanodon, Deinonychus, and Tyrannosaurus. Fossil God, hey, welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Yeah. Struthiosaurus. Scalidosaurus. These are... Acanthophilus. Um, Acanthophilus. Silvisaurus. Yeah. Oh, boy, these illustrations are so, like, just muddy-looking and brown and old-fashioned and scaly and oh goodness i i could spend an entire stream just showing you like up-to-date versions of some of these dinosaurs like i'm sure it's going to show ankylosaurus in a little bit and so i'll show you what our modern picture of ankylosaurus is this is from that game saurian and they did a tremendous job with these designs here, this is the most accurate, up-to-date Ankylosaurus I have seen anywhere. It is really excellent. Even down to the coloration here. With this kind of striking, don't mess with me yellow like that. Almost like you would see on a Gila monster or a Mexican beaded lizard. Uh, those warning, warning color patterns like that. Yeah. Really, really nice. Um, very pretty, right, Raven? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And, uh... Oh, and Fossil God... Uh... Wondering what this video you were watching was. Oh. This is called, uh... Dinosaurs, Fun, Fact, and Fantasy. Right here. I'll give you a link. It is from 1982. There you go. Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, let's go ahead and continue, shall we? Two O Dinosaurus. Paleoskinkus. Terrible. Oh boy. Ankylosaurus. 
Ankylosaurus. So again, there is our Ankylosaurus in here. And then there is our modern picture of Ankylosaurus. Uh, yeah. I mean, shoot, even the head doesn't look right. We've had a like a proper Ankylosaurus skull since, you know, Barnum Brown first published on it back in the early 1900s. You know, and it looks like this. How did they get that so wrong here? Yeah. Notosaurus. Yeah. Stegosaurus. Yeah. There they go. The last of the dinosaur dozens. Well, you certainly know a bit about dinosaurs, Dill. Well, of course. My great, 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, this is from the 1925 film The Lost World. We'll watch that one of these days. Yeah, there you go. about the Saurian Ankylosaurus. It's, it's very nice, Lenina. Yeah. <laughs> They're just filling a lot of time here showing this. Some urban redevelopment there. There's Tower Bridge. Yeah. And there you go, Ali J. Exactly. See if anybody knows. Oh, no. Oh, boy. We have watched this before, and I remember this part being, like, really tedious with all of these puppets and everything, and... Oh, I don't know if we want to do this, do we? Shoot, how much longer does it go? Does it go for the whole rest of the video? Uh... Yeah, let's just skip that part. Anyway. You saw! Yeah, anyway. That quiz was more about non-dinosaurs than dinosaurs, Dill. Well, if you want to know more about real dinosaurs, there are lots of things that you may care to explore in the world of dinosaurs. And that's right, sure. Dill. Look at all this lot. Dino puzzles. So these are the, like, balsa wood puzzles that you can get. These are still available today, the same exact ones. They're pretty out of date. But there is actually... Oh, she's got the plates on backwards. Uh, yeah, these are... These are backwards. Anyway, you can actually get, like, modern, up-to-date dinosaur puzzles like that. Um, shoot, what was the company, the new company that produces those? Um... Here's one from Make CNC, but there's a. I've seen. I think I follow them on Twitter. Um. Anyway, this is pretty decent right here. That's really really nice. I like that a lot. Holy cow. That's really good. But shoot, what are they called? Um. Was it? No. Man, there's okay. Let's see if I can find this here. Um, that's annoying. I didn't follow them. How did that end up? If I can't find it right now, then I'll make sure that I take note of it the next time that I see a tweet from them. And, uh, I'll recommend them if anybody's looking for, uh... Uh, for a gift for, like, a young person who's really interested in fossils or natural history or puzzles. 
because these are pretty excellent. Um, yeah. Where would that be? If I don't find it in the next couple seconds, I will turn back. Let's see. Nope, and Twitter does not have a search function for who you're following either, so nuts to that. Anyway, there is a small independent company that produces some really, really excellent uh, wooden dinosaur skeletons, much better than these ones, which have been available since the 70s. So yeah, and hey, Creatrix Brit, how you doing? Welcome, welcome. Good to have you here. Yeah... And uh, eyewitness docs, we might do that one next. Another time, avocado, avogado, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And avocado, avogado says, I recall reading a New York Times article a month ago about legal issues over fossils. Was that, uh, let's see. Was that this one here? Yeah, because I actually had a media appearance about this. Uh, I think you showed it on the Discord back then. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's the one? Well. I, uh... I don't know if you caught it, but I had a... Where, where is it? It's on my YouTube here. But I was on... What was the station called? GB News? Um, yeah, here we go. With Michael Portillo? Yeah. Welcome back. In the world too loud? of dinosaur bones, something is out of joint. A skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus rex named Shem was due to be auctioned with appropriate hype in Hong Kong this year. Yeah. Expected to fetch more than 20 million pounds, Shen was abruptly withdrawn from sale by uh, auction house Christie's. Thanks, Claire. Nice. Over the provenance of parts of the skeleton. The plot thickens as it appears that some of Shen may be replicated. Most bones of, of Shen. Almost all of stack. Shen. Yeah. This Jurassic whodunit has serious implications. Globally, millions are made illegally trading bones and fossils which are diverted from scientists who could study them. Yep. Uh, David Waterhouse is the senior curator of natural history and geology at Norfolk Museum and joins us from Norwich. Hello, good to speak to you again. Yeah, and, nice to see you, Michael. And from Northern California, dino dinosaur paleontologist Danny Anduza, who hosts <laughs> Paleontologizing, which can be viewed on Twitch. Um, so, uh, David, first of all, Anyway, if you'd like to watch this, here is the link there in the chat. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is back in November. November 27th, 2022. Uh, he almost said Danielologist. I know, right, Clerber? <laughs> and uh, thank you, Rothgar. Hey, well, shoot. You know, David Waterhouse is a museum curator. He's you know, does not stream on Twitch all the time. He's not going to have a fancy mic set up like I do. So, yeah. Uh, the way the dude said Twitch was hilarious, was it? Let's go back. Uh, uh. which can be viewed on Twitch. Um, Northern California, dino dinosaur paleontologist Danny Anduza, who hosts Paleontologizing, which can be viewed on Twitch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... Anyway, and internally he's thinking, what is this Twitch thing? I know, right, Oscar Juniors? Yeah. Well, you know, not everybody can be as young and hip as you, Oscar Juniors, and know what things like Twitch are. My goodness. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. Anywho, let's, uh, let's continue with this, shall we? Yeah. Dino Kits. 
Man, really paltry stuff back in the 80s. Dino models. Kids today have it so much better. There's so many excellent the dinosaur dino club that you can join. And of course, there are... there's so many wonderful, wonderful dinosaur toys that you can get nowadays. Dinosaur toys and models and everything. Um, shoot. For instance, uh, come on, Google Images. What are you taking so long? Uh. Yeah, Beasts of the Mesozoic is this series. You can get these online, and I would not be shocked if they actually had them in gift shops in places, too. But they are exquisite. Um, nothing like this existed when I was a kid. Uh, really, really extraordinary stuff. Uh, here's Ceratopsian dinosaurs from Beasts of the Mesozoic. Like, really well-rendered, beautiful details, super accurate, gorgeous color schemes. Very brightly colored. Yeah. Shoot. There are so many. Aura or Eofauna. Um, really excellent stuff. Here are some Eofauna models. Uh, oh, shoot. There's Yoshi's trike. This is a dinosaur that I excavated. Helped dig up the post crania of this dinosaur with the Museum of the Rockies in 2011. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Eofauna makes some really excellent stuff there. Yeah. In fact, here's a, a video review that somebody put together. 13 minutes. Link is in the description. Remember, if you order anything from Dan's Dinosaur... Holy cow. I think this is actually where I got that from. Another Eofauna review. Today we take a look at their new Triceratops figures. Yeah. Uh, we crank out a lot of figures each year, but when they do give us a release, the figures are very well researched and extremely well done. And these yeah. Triceratops have no exception. And a first for Eofauna, they released this figure <laughs> in two separate paint schemes. This one right here is the uh, paint scheme, and this one is the cryptic. Each figure comes with a little pamphlet tied to the leg that gives you a little bit of information about this Triceratops. A little bit of information. Come with the same exact collector card with this beautiful collector card figures yeah and the way they are shipped they actually come <laughs> with a tray that's securely placed over the horn so you yeah that was really cool so they don't get deformed they are the slightly flexible materials so that is a good idea to ship them uh oh extra protection got my uh 3d printer needs some attention what is going on with that my junk sticking up There we go. Sorry that took so long. Um, and now it moves to the other side. But yeah, anyhow. This sort of thing did not exist when I was a kid. Um, so it's really, really cool to see that now. This is based on a particular species of Triceratops. Uh, that skull is actually based on that of Yoshi's trike. Thank you, Zentaus. Are we having printer issues today, Danny? Not really, Zentaus. It's, it's chugging away the way it should. I'm just being a little fussy about it, honestly. Printing this uh, iguana on hand. But anyway, yeah. Um. Anywho, uh, yeah. And uh, couldn't he have mis pseudo pronounced the silent vowel between the T and the CH? I don't. I'm not sure what you're talking about, Jody Fish. Uh, 
uh, Twitch, Jody Fish. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm far behind her. Uh, Tumor Boy says, "I mean, we didn't have the internet when we were kids. That's true." Um, companies making toys had to do a lot of hard research to find accurate info for making dinosaur toys in the 80s. Yeah. Um, that's definitely true. Although, yeah, it, it was never as difficult as they make it out to be, though. You know, like, for the price of a couple of beers, you could ask a graduate student in paleontology, you know, to help critique something for you and, you know, get some really good information. Like, it's, it's never been that difficult to do this kind of thing. But yeah. Likewise for, you know, making making sure that your 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 movies have accurate dinosaurs and stuff like that. Um yeah. And today toy makers can do a quick Google search and come up with more accurate models and art to go by. That's true, but also they'll end up with a lot of garbage too. So like if we do a an image search for let's try triceratops. Triceratops. Most of your top results are going to be just absolutely dog water garbage. Like this, from Jurassic World. This is a really lousy Triceratops. Just garbage bin quality. Uh, this is from the Natural History Museum in London, and that's a solidly like 30 years out of date, at least. Um, yeah. Um, again, garbage quality. Uh, this is from Mattel from a long time ago. If they're removed, America loses them forever. McDiggity, thank you for subscribing. Really appreciate that, McDiggity. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. And again, when I say that, you know, this and that is, oh, it's garbage, this is lousy, it's not me trying to be mean-spirited, and that's not... It's not me going like, well, actually, according to my calculations, it should be like this. It's like, the thing is, real Triceratops looks way cooler than any of this garbage. Like, this is a, it's a missed opportunity. So, like, Saurian really got it right. Here is their Triceratops process right here, and it is gorgeous. Really, really nice. Um, because it's based on good scholarship, you know. Try blaming the dinosaurs. Thank you, Lordy, for those two hundred bits. You got us started with a hype train, there, Lordy. Uh, and Delta Rain, thank you for the hundred bits. Beautiful. Thank you, thank you, Delta. Excellent. Yeah. Uh. But yeah, yeah. If you're feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. Thank you, Dither, for those hundred bits. Excellent. Yeah. Good stuff, good stuff. Um. But yeah, that's not the perfectionist in me, Zintaus. It's, you know, people deserve good dinosaurs. You know, I... Hang on a minute here. Thank you for the ten gift subs, Zintaus. Uh-oh. You may have overloaded our Tinamu bird here. I'm gonna back slowly away. It's increasing. Critical mass. Take cover. Zintaus is overloading the system with 10 gift subs. Thank you, Zintaus. Really, really appreciate that. 10 gift subs. Extraordinary. We are now at 15 out of our 40 goal for the day. Thank you, Zentaus. Thank you kindly. That means a lot to me. It really does. Thank you for supporting Science Outreach here on Twitch. And if any of you lucky folks just got a gift sub, thanks to the very generous Zentaus. Please thank them. Thank you, Murph, for those five gift subs there. Three of them are leading this expedition. I appreciate that, Murph, very much. Thank you, thank you. 20 out of 40 now. We are halfway to our goal for the day. Thank you. Holy cow. Yeah. Really excellent. 
Oh. <laughs> anyway, welcome, welcome, Lordy. It's good to see you. I hope you're feeling better. I know you've been under the weather. Uh, Delta, it's lovely to see you, too. Hope you're having a good day. Thanks for being here. And, uh... Dithers in Taos and Murph, thank you so much for your support. That's lovely. If we manage to get to a level 5 hype train here, I'll play some ukulele songs. Maybe we'll have three days in a row with ukulele. We'll see. We had it yesterday and Monday. So, uh... But yeah. Sincere yeah. appreciation and gratitude. Thank you very much to the 100 bits. Thank you. Halfway to the goal, but we're close to that you paleo -yuk. This is true, Lordy. This is true. And, gratitude. and thank you, Delta. Thank you, Delta. That's excellent. Really appreciate that. <laughs> Splendid. Yeah. Uh, we're 38% of the way to a level 4, and then we've got one level after that before ukulele. So let's see if we can get there. And uh, thank you, Delta Rain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I really, really like the uh, the Saurian Triceratops. And this was put together by an independent team. They didn't have a, a budget or anything like that. Like, yeah, Saurian, it's, it's a group of people who are doing this because they're passionate about this project, you know? And they reached out and consulted a bunch of paleontologists who were happy to give input for free. And uh, they came up with a really, really extraordinary model for their Triceratops. Really excellent. Um, there's another one there. It actually changes through ontogeny. Aren't those markings cool, Lordy? They're beautiful, right? Yeah. Ontogeny. Uh, and yeah, ontogeny. Here. Shoot, here we go. Um, nope. Here. Wrong scene. There we go. In the game, these animals actually change... Ontogeny. Ontogeny like this. From a hatchling up until a full-grown, fully mature adult. Ontogeny. And it actually matches what we see in the fossil record. This is based on real fossil evidence, you know? Yeah. Ontogeny. So, uh, so yeah. Yeah. Uh. But yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. And, uh. Beware the groups of small triceratops, they are very... Yeah, they, they did kill me once, Claire Burr. That was pretty funny. As uh, as a juvenile dromaeosaur. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. The thing is, like... Good dinosaurs are very attainable. And, uh... Especially today. You know? Yeah. Um, uh... And how big would they have gotten if they were able to grow beyond the extinction? That's a great question, Zentaus. If you're talking about Triceratops in particular. So Triceratops... Um, is one of the very largest of the Ceratopsids. It's often cited as the largest of the Ceratopsians. Uh, that's not Triceratops horridus. That's Triceratops prorsus right there. That's wrong. But, uh, anyway, yeah. There's kind of a smaller Triceratops. They get significantly bigger than that, you know? Just the skull of a Triceratops can be pretty big. That's a sculpt. That's not the actual thing. A lot of details wrong with that. But, um, anyway, yeah, these are big animals. Here's, uh, here are some of the largest dinosaurs in any particular group. What is up with that sauropod? Yowza, that's lousy. Anyway, Triceratops is really big. Um, there it is compared to a person. Just kind of waving there. Hi, big dinosaurs. Um, yeah. So, Triceratops is an example of... Uh, of what we call Cope's Rule. So, Cope's Rule, uh, named after American paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope. He was the guy with the mustache from earlier. And we don't have a picture of him here. But anyway. Um, uh, 
There's Cope right there. Yeah. Edward Drinker Cope. Uh, one of the primary combatants in the Bone Wars. With him and Othniel Charles Marsh. Uh, Cope came up with an idea... Well, it's called Cope's Rule, but like... In reality, it's only kind of loosely associated with him. Anyway, it's never actually stated by Cope, although he favored the occurrence of linear evolutionary trends. The idea is that... That as a lineage continues, the average size of those critters tends to go up. And so, like, the longer a lineage is around, the bigger those critters tend to get. It'd be lovely if there were, like, a YouTube video about this, but... I doubt there will be. Uh, at the Dead Lizard Society. In, uh, oh, there we go. Let's, well, shoot, let's take a look at this and see if this is any good. Hey guys, welcome to my channel. In this video, we are going to discuss Cope Rule. This is a part three of the topic 1.4, Human yeah, Evolution and Emergence of Man. This is also known as the Rule of Increase in Size Tendency. This video is presented by me, Aman Yadav. So before we begin the video, I have brought for you a PDF with thousand questions yeah. from books. We try So Edward Coop, an American <laughs> paleontologist, who gave this yep. law, let's talk about it. The uh -huh. fossils of mammals gave this. This rule states that organisms have a tendency towards increase in size during evolution. So <laughs> during evolutions. <laughs> um yeah, so it's not really a rule, but I don't know. The way that I usually think about, about Cope's rule, it's certainly not a law, because it's definitely not true in all cases. There are plenty of exceptions to it, but it's just kind of like a general tendency. You know, rules, it's more like, more like guidelines, you know? Cope's rule is really more of a guideline than anything else. But we see it in a lot of dinosaur lineages. Um... So, like with Tyrannosaurs, T-Rex, the last of the Tyrannosaurs, is also the largest of the Tyrannosaurs. Triceratops is the last of the Ceratopsians, also, depending on who you ask, the largest of the Ceratopsians. Um, same with, uh, I don't know, lots and lots of other dinosaurs, too. It's not true for dromaeosaurs. Like, Utah Raptor is the largest dromaeosaur. It's also one of the first ones that we have. Um, but in other lineages, Spinosaurus seems to be the largest of the Spinosaurs. It's also the last. So there's a... Generally speaking, in many cases, if not most cases, as a lineage continues to evolve, new species develop, they tend to get larger over time. All other things being equal. There's plenty of exceptions to that, but that's basically Cope's rule like that. So how big would Triceratops have gotten if the asteroid had not hit 66 million years ago? If the, these dinosaurs had been allowed to, to continue to evolve? They probably would have gotten bigger, you know? Because that's just kind of a gentle, general tendency there. Like, yeah, they, they, they kind of get bigger, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, oh, and Clairber found that clip. Holy cow. Maybe Triceratops. My goodness. I've never seen these before. These are brand new. Oh, man. They're so tiny. <laughs> I'm being mobbed by them right now. <laughs> wow. Destroyed. Uh. Fatality. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway. So yeah, baby Triceratops is as big as... Well, I don't know. That's I can't really say that, actually, because they hatch out of really small eggs. But anywho. Yeah. Uh, Fossil God says, Have you ever been to Dino Lab in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada? No, never been there. 
They're prepping a Triceratops Horridus named Dozer. Really? Where did they get that fossil god? That's interesting. I've dug up probably 20 or 30 Triceratops over the course of my career. Dug up a lot of trikes in the Hell Creek Formation, uh, including Yoshi's Trike um, from the Yoshi's Trike site. Cliffhanger Trike, Denver's Trike, um, Joe's Trike 3, Big Ollie, uh, lots and lots of other trikes. Um, so yeah, yeah. So there's a few at Museum of the Rockies that I, uh, that I helped dig up. There's at least one at the Burke Museum in Seattle that I helped dig up in 2014. Yeah. Art Young Might says, I'm really new to paleontology, meaning I don't have any scientific knowledge, but I'm just generally interested in it. Well, you're in the right place, Art Young Might. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Uh, one question I've always had is how you can tell what color a dinosaur was from their fossils. I've heard of melanosomes, but I'm unsure as to what is found in fossil digging since it's always seen as just bones, but melanosomes are located in the skin, right? No, that's the thing. Anytime we have melanosomes, that means that we have preserved skin or more often preserved feathers. Yeah. Um, so in the case of Sinoceropteryx, for instance. There we go. We actually have... This is so well preserved with fossil feathers running down the sagittal plane, like running along its back right there. See that fringe of feathers on the top? Uh, and see how they get kind of stripey when you get to the tail? Those actually correspond to stripes on the animal's tail. And there are melanosomes preserved in the feathers there. So that's the only times that we can actually tell what color a dinosaur was, is when we have preserved feathers or preserved skin. If we just have the skeleton, just the bones, then we have no idea what color the animal was. Does that make sense? You gotta have preserved skin or preserved feathers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway. Great question there, uh, Art Young Might. Yeah. Uh, but there you go. And there you go, Triceratops. Yeah. Uh, Elusive Deer says, I'm quite uneducated in the field of paleontology. Again, you're in the right place. Stick around here. You won't feel uneducated for much longer. Yeah. I was wondering if there have been mix-ups in the past for what bones belong to which dinosaurs, and if that happens still. It's a lot more rare nowadays. It's definitely happened in the past. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, excuse my ignorance. No, don't say that. Shoot, you're... Those are exactly the kind of questions that I love to get. So thank you, thank you for asking that. That's brilliant. Yeah, there have been a number of times in the past where things have certainly gotten mixed up. Um, yeah... I'm trying to think, what are some pertinent examples of this? The Brontosaurus, the Patasaurus thing springs to mind. But everybody knows that one. Um, let's see. Maybe Dynamosaurus? Dynamosaurus is a good example. <clears throat> there we go. Um... Yeah, what? They're showing us like in a belly sore. Anyway, um, so Dynamosaurus is the same dinosaur as T-Rex. But when Barnum Brown was digging it up, he found these bones that looked very similar to Tyrannosaurus bones. And he found some armor plates nearby. And uh, he assumed that the armor plates came from that dinosaur and he named it Dynamosaurus. And uh, thank you, Lantern SC, for the follow. Welcome, welcome. That first one, there wasn't a dinosaur, actually. That was Dimetrodon that the kid was gesturing toward. Anyway, yeah. Uh, Dynamosaurus is an example of that, where, like, parts from different dinosaurs got mixed up. Um, anyway, yeah. Um, I bet you I can find you a write-up about that. Uh... Let's see. Mm -hmm. I guess this will work on Twitter. Yeah. 
Dynamosaurus was originally thought to be a separate species, separate genus, but was soon discovered to be Tyrannosaurus. When it was discovered, Dynamosaurus was depicted as having scutes of armor, but those belonged to a Notosaurid. Yeah, there you go. Um, th there's an example of that. It, that luckily doesn't happen very often anymore. We're typically a lot more careful with how we excavate things, and we'd have much better documentation, and... We usually have teams working on stuff rather than just one person following hunches and stuff. But yeah, great question, Elusive Deer. Great question. Yeah. Nowadays, there are many other ways to make mistakes uh, that are much more complicated than like, oh, shoot, bones from the wrong animal, you know? But yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah... They prep fossils for various places like the Royal Terrell. Oh, very cool fossil god. I did not know that. Very nice. So it's from Hell Creek. That makes sense. You don't find Triceratops in many places other than the Hell Creek and the Lance formations. So yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I wonder if that's from Saskatchewan, maybe. Or it could be, it could also be from the Scholard formation. Canada's got some Hell Creek equivalent age stuff. But yeah. Um... But yeah, yeah. Uh, Dinosauria in general. What do you mean, birds are dead on? It's good to see you. Welcome, birds. Yeah. T Rex and then Kylosaur scutes. That's the idea there, Jody Fish. Yeah. Yeah. And you're welcome, Elusive Deer. Thanks for the great question. Yeah. Triceratops is. Now you can use ChatGPT to make the mistakes for you. There you go. You can automate the mistakes. You know? No longer can you just chalk it up to, like, oh yeah, everybody's human. Like, oh yeah, a computer did it. Of course it's going to be full of mistakes, you know? Of course it's going to be wrong. <laughs> uh, anyway. Well, that said, let's get back to our... Uh, let's get back to this. Let's finish this out. And a dino club that you can join. Dino club. There are lots of museums where you can see our old friends. Diplodocus. Diplodocus. Aha. Diplodocus. Triceratops, <laughs> Iguanodon, Megalosaurus. That's They're Allosaurus, actually, but whatever. Though you won't usually be allowed to walk on them. And models of what they really look like. Or what we used to think they looked like. Man, those are old. My goodness. Uh, there are some dino parks you can visit to see dinosaur uh, statues. You could always go looking it, for fossils like Mary Anning did. Or in quarries like the Mantell. And hang on, uh, Pachypoda, yeah, Pachypoda is like a, that's a discarded name for Dinosauria in general. Who was it who suggested that? I forget. But, uh, anyway, yeah, there have been a couple of other names that were suggested for dinosaurs, but Dinosauria is the one that's always, the one that's always held out. So, that's yeah. the lot. Lots of places to find dinosaurs. And I'll see you there as well, because we crocs are always around. Bye-bye. <laughs> Very nice. Uh. <laughs> uh. So there you go. We uh we got through it. <laughs> uh. I could do something with this song, but what? I don't know. Good stuff. I'm glad you like that. Trike, yeah. And Dougal Dixon consulted on this. Did he really? Very nice. Yeah. Program consultant, Dougal Dixon. Good stuff. Again, if you would like to watch this on your own time, here is a link. There you go. And uh, Breezy1521, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Yeah. Um, good stuff. I'm glad we got through that whole thing. Uh, yeah, very nice. Well, and I told you I was starting early for today's stream. And I did. That means I'm also going to be ending early for today's stream. 
but I'll be streaming again tomorrow at 2 p.m. in California time. We're going to have a special Thursday Birds Day stream along with our usual Q&A. And we'll also be talking about the Central Asiatic Expeditions for Roy Chapman Andrews Day. But don't go away, everybody, just yet. We're going to wrap things up, but we're going to be raiding in to somebody else discussing science here on Twitch. And if you haven't yet met Evo Lazi, you're in for a treat. So let's go ahead and wrap things up here with Archaeopteryx there under our credits. And, uh, yeah, Thursday Birds Day. That's right, if any of you uh, have not yet photographed a bird for Thursday Birds Day, a bird from your neighborhood, from, you know, where you live, consider doing that. This bird right there. Uh, I kit one claw. Thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to paleontologizing. Come on, where's our, where's our credits? Why is this not working properly? Come on, credits. Uh, don't know why it's doing that. That's a little frustrating. And Evo Lazi changed his username. That's why the raid didn't work, too. He's now Dr. Evo Lazi. He's got his PhD recently. Don't know why our credits aren't working. Apologies for that. Here, let's try this instead. Uh, shoot. I don't know why it's not working. It's, you know, Streamlabs. It's not guaranteed to work. Anyway, everybody, thank you for a wonderful stream. I hope you had a great time today. Hope you had a nice... It was supposed to be a chill stream, and that's exactly what we had. Exciting stuff coming up tomorrow. Until then, I hope everybody, you take care of yourselves. Be kind to yourselves and others. Thank you, subscribers and gifters and cheerers, question askers and lurkers and chatters and moderators. Thank you, everybody, for everything that you've done for this community. Uh, you make this community what it is, and I appreciate you for it. Thank you, thank you. We're going to go check out Dr. Evo Lazi. I will see you there, everybody. All right. Till tomorrow, bye-bye.